Salam alaikum to you all. Thanks for coming. Thanks for you know being in this very hot room despite all the problems. And I understand you know we had a problem with uh, the double reservation. And I thank uh, you know Abdullah for finding me and the Islamic Society to bring me here from Turkey. And you know it's a pleasure certainly. Well, uh, as as brother said, you know I've written this book. And what's the story? Why I wrote a book like this? I mean, first of all, I should say I am not a, an advocate of an Islamic reform, especially with a big R. Uh, I sometimes speak of Islamic renewal, tajdeed, which is a part of our tradition. I mean, reform is actually a Christian term. I'm not offended by the term, but actually it does, it's not a term that is coming from, from our own tradition. So that's not a term that I generally, generally use. That's one thing. Secondly, I am not any religious authority at all. I'm not an imam. I'm not a faqih. I'm nothing. I'm just an ordinary Muslim. So everything that I say about uh, our religion, about Islam, is what I think as an individual Muslim who has done some reading about the history of our thought, about the history of the development of Islamic fiqh or uh, sharia, uh, and some of the interesting debates in early Islamic thought, which I think are very, very important for today. And I have been writing in Turkish media that is relevant to Turkey's events. I've been writing in the English language media. Sometimes to explain what Turkey is, because there's a secularist narrative about Turkey which says uh, Turkey needs dictatorship, because secular dictatorship, because this, if pious Muslims come to power, they will, uh, they will have create another Taliban you know, state in Turkey, so that's why we need dictatorship. And that argument was actually repeated by the Mubareks of the world and the Bin Ali's of the world in Tunisia and Egypt and so on. So there was a kind of anti-democratic argument uh, for the Middle East. Uh, democracy was fo found dangerous for Muslim societies because it brought wrong people to power. That was the argument. So in my articles in the West, I try to challenge that narrative to some extent. Um, but let me explain you first, why did I write this particular book? I mean, it's, it took two years to write it, but there's a longer, longer history. And actually, I think everything began, as I explained in the introduction, in, uh, in early 80s in Ankara. I was growing up in Ankara. Uh, Istanbul is certainly better. If you're going to go to Turkey, go to Istanbul. Ankara is just boring, but I was growing there. <laughs> and uh, I was visiting my grandparents' uh, place every weekend, uh, and my grandparents, my grandfather and grandmom, uh, may they rest in peace, uh, they were very pious Muslims. And one thing they wanted to do was to teach me Islam as an as a eight year or nine year old kid. And I think I was nine years old, and I was going to my grandfather's place. I was learning how to pray, how to go to mosque. I was learning how to write La ilaha illallah with colorful beads. You know, it was a very first juvenile introduction, crash course, if you will, into Islam. And I loved it. I loved everything that I learned. Uh, but in my, one day, I remember in my father's library, grandfather's library, I found the book. Uh, it was titled Guide to Prayer. Turks would know Namaz you know. And at the back side of the, at the back cover of the book, there were two different quotes, and one was from the Quran. And it said, "It is Allah who has created you, and who has given you eyes, ears, and feelings. How little thanks you give." And that was a very striking verse for me, and it still is, because it told me that I don't even own my body; it is all given to me. Everything that I think of that I owe is actually given by my Creator, by Allah by God. But the second quote was a little not that inspiring, I should say. Because it said, if your children, and it was not from the Quran, that's important. It said, if your children do not start to pray at the age of 10, then beat them up. Now here I was at the age of 9, <laughs> learning that I might be in trouble in a year if I don't start to pray regularly. And I remember feeling a little uneasy about that, and I asked my grandfather about this, and he said, no, no, it's for bad kids, we never, of course, beat you up, and so on. Uh, and I felt okay, but I remember that that day, I had like a juvenile question, and the question was, well, is it a good thing to beat kids, one thing. Secondly, would it be helpful if I was coerced into prayer? Would I be really doing something good as a Muslim if I prayed 
not to worship God, but to avoid a slap in my face. Would coercion, in other words, really help my religiosity? Now, years went by, and I kept thinking about this. And in Turkey, I've engaged with various Islamic traditions, from the Nursi tradition, from uh, the you know, basic texts of Islam. And I've studied Islamic societies as a writer, as a researcher, as a somewhat of an academic. And I've kept asking that question, because I saw oppressive attitudes in Muslim societies, in some Muslim societies, I should say. Uh, and these attitudes even became globally famous and even sometimes notorious. Like, for example, in Saudi Arabia, there's an institution called the Mutawa, the religious police. And one of the jobs of the Mutawa is to make sure that you go to prayer when the prayer time comes, when the adhan is called. At least you should close your shop and show that you're actually not you know, uh, do, making any trade during the prayer, prayer time comes. When I saw that and I first read about it, I said, well, well okay, here's a problem because if you go to a mosque because the religious police tells you to go, is this good for your ikhlas, for your, for your like, sincerity? Uh, shouldn't you go to a mosque because you want to, because you want to worship God and no one coerces you? And wouldn't the Islamic mission would be to call to prayer, as we have a call to prayer, maybe advise fellow Muslims to do their prayers and be better Muslims, but not coerce them. Because if you coerce them, what do you achieve? Now, this, this idea, again, became very apparent when I saw some people in Iran or Saudi Arabia. There are many pious religious people there in those countries. But I also saw Saudis or Iranians wearing chadors and you know, their very conservative dresses uh, in their home countries, but then take, to the, first, take the first plane to, plane to London, maybe, and take all those clothes off and go to bars and have some party and so, so on, which is Islamically obviously not very uh, commendable. Again, the, the idea was, is forcing these people making them more religious? Is it, is it something good to do? So that is the really core of my concern in, in this whole argument. And my take has been this, well, it doesn't make sense in the beginning to coerce people to be religious. Secondly, it is against some of the very basic principles of Quran. I mean, every Muslim knows the basic Quranic verse. There is no compulsion in religion. Uh, there are other verses, like one verse says, the truth is from your Lord. Let anyone who wants to believe it, believe it. Let anyone who wants to disbelieve it, disbelieve it. There are many other foundations for religious freedom uh, and the freedom of conscience in the Quran, which basically shows that actually you cannot force people to be pious and to make them remain as Muslims. So where does this then this authoritarian mindset comes from? These authoritarian laws, institutions, and its attitudes come from. Now I started to think about this, and gradually I saw something else. The something else was the fact that in our part of the world, in what we call the Muslim part of the world, the people who are authoritarian are not just pious Muslims. The people who are authoritarian can be very secular people. Actually, very secularist, passionately secularist people are actually very authoritarian too. For example, you know, in, in Saudi Arabia, again, there's a, there's a rule that you have to wear a hijab. You have to. Well, in Turkey, we had something else. You had to take off the hijab. And it was certainly tyranny, you know, named, named, uh, named after secularism, progress, modernity, whatever you call it. Uh, but it was equally authoritarian. And in Turkey, we thought that, and it's still not over, I mean, still you can't wear a hijab in Turkey and be a public servant. Uh, and it's, it's still a battle that's going on. But our secularists were so obsessively authoritarian that I said, well, actually, the mindset which forces the people, forces women to put the hijab on, and the mindset which forces women to take the hijab off is the very same mindset. And maybe the problem in the Islamic tradition is that this mindset, which is out there anyway, has influenced some Islamic attitudes. Maybe religion and this authoritarian attitude became confused over time. Like tradition, as, as we see in, in other cases, like we, for example, 
uh, probably most of you would, you would agree with me that there's a practice in northeastern Africa called female circumcision or female genital mutilation, and the people who practice think that this is an Islamic thing to do, but many scholars, well, it's not, no, there's nothing in the Quran which justify that. Actually, there are verses in the Quran which I think totally would de-justify that, but it's not in the basic text of Islam. It's a tradition which was confused with Islam and became a part of Islam in the minds of some Muslims. In Turkey, we're, on the other hand, for example, we have no idea about that. I mean, nobody has heard about it. So, so could this authoritarian attitude become, be a product of not our religion, but our history? The history, including some particular traditions, mindsets, attitudes, uh, traditions of men, not really divinely inspired, you know, divinely ordained rules. And that was the the, the, these were the basic senses that I had uh, when I looked at uh, Islamic law and these authoritarian elements that we can find there. And here, I found, I mean, th and the things that I found is made up a story and it's in the book. But let me give you just a few examples. When we speak of these authoritarian attitudes, what are we speaking about? Like, let me one, give you one concrete, very clear case. The ban on apostasy. Uh, apostasy, which is uh, ridda, or you know, irtida, you know, in Arabic, which is like changing your religion for something else. Like, if you're a Muslim, if you say, for example, our brother is a for like revert from Christianity to Islam, and I'm honored to see that. Um, but there are people who also say, well, I was a Muslim, but now I'll be a Christian. There are people who make that decision, or a Buddhist, or whatever, or maybe an atheist. There are people like that. So, what should be the Islamic attitude towards this? Of course, no Muslim would like to see a fellow Muslim you know, changing his religion, but if that happens, what are we supposed to do? Well, in classical Sharia, in all the four, course, uh, four mesheps, uh, evident in the Shiite also tradition, uh, sh apostasy uh, is considered a crime, and the punishment is death. So if you say, I'm, a, I'm not a Muslim, I'm a Christian now, you're given that penalty. And this became a very controversial issue uh, in the previous years, especially, for example, in 2006, when a Christian, well, when a former Muslim named Abdul Rahman converted to Christianity in Afghanistan, he was given death penalty by the uh, Afghan <coughs> courts, and he was given three days to recant, and he didn't change his mind. And the death penalty would be implemented, but then the international community, you know, had a lot of pressure on the Afghan government, and they set the man free and he, you know, fled to Italy and, you know, went on his life uh, safe and sound. But that became an international issue. Again, in Egypt, a particular uh, Yusuf Nadar Khani was given that penalty again. And, I mean, the case is pending, but so. There are examples like this. So this is not just only creating problems in the Muslim community, but it's creating a problem internationally. So people are asking, what are you trying to do? I mean, if this is a religion that you can't get in or you can get out, I mean, how, how are you going to defend this? People ask this question to us. But what about our loyalty to our tradition? What are we going to make sense of this? Well, here is what... I mean, the people who have studied the, the issue of this... Uh, the, study the origin of this ban on apostasy come to the same conclusion, actually. First of all, there is nothing in the Quran which bans apostasy. No worse. Uh, actually, there is a verse which hints that at the time of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, people could change Islam, go to Islam and come and backward because it's, the verse speaks about those who have believed first and then deny first and then believe first and go to Kufr first. Mm -hmm. So it shows that actually you could go back and forth. I mean, you could change your idea, you could change your mind. <coughs> the ban on apostasy comes from secondary sources, from the Hadith sources and how they are interpreted by the ulama. But people who look at this, like scholars like, for example, uh, Abdullah Said, who has a good book on this, uh, they've noticed one thing. This, the ulama, which thought that apostasy should be punished, were thinking in a particular context, the context of war, in which Muslims were fighting a community that could be the, Sassanid, the pagans of Mecca, the Sassanids, and the Persians, and they thought apostasy as changing your side in battle. So that's what, and everybody punishes that. I mean, like today in the modern world, even modern nation states, they have a notion of high treason. So if you 
uh, if you're an American soldier and you deserve to die side, that, that, that army will punish you. Uh, that's why, for example, in the Hanafi school, the death penalty for apostates were, were given only to males, thinking that females are not soldiers. Females do not constitute a military threat, at least in medieval warfare. So, based on that, should we say, well, that apostasy ban can be understandable in that context, in the medieval context, where you, if you change your religion, it becomes a political treason to the political community. But we live today in a different context, and we should reinterpret this. And, and that's my argument for, if you want to call it reform, reform, and I would call it tajdeed, you know, understanding that Islamic law had a particular context, and as context should cha change, you should sometimes change laws as well. And this is not actually a, like an unheard of law, I mean, inter or un unheard of approach. Uh, in the Ottoman Empire, many of these laws were changed. Uh, as Muslims realized that as times went by, laws should change. As Ottoman scholar Ahmed Ziyadeh Pasha wrote in, his, in the beginning of his Mejalla, the great Ottoman legal code in the 19th century. That's why Ottomans, for example, abolished the legal structure which defined Jews and Christians as zimmis, you know, protected but not equal citizens, and made them equal citizens with the Tanzimat reforms of the middle 19th century. And Ottoman scholars justify this Islamically by saying that you know, Sharia should adopt according to changing times. Now, if you have this more dynamic understanding of Islamic law, actually m almost everything that you see as illiberal or authoritarian makes sense in a medieval sense, but then you, you, you can understand them in a much more different perspective. Let me give you another example of this. Uh, again, in Saudi Arabia, you might have heard that there's a ban on women's driving. Yeah, women cannot drive cars. Uh, like, I don't know why. I mean, of course, the Quran has nothing to say about women's driving. Well, the Saudis have few... I've spoken to Saudis and, like, uh, clerics on this and say it's fitna and so on, and ideas. But they have one particular argument. They say, they refer to the hadiths, which advise against women traveling alone. Uh, now, I asked this to Professor Mehmet Görmez, the head of Turkish Diyanet, the uh, religious authority in Turkey, who is now working on a Hadith project, which will put Hadiths in context, and also maybe eliminate some of the Mevdu Hadiths, which we think as Sahih, like, which we think as authentic, but maybe not. But anyway, Mehmet Görmez said, told me something. He said, it is of course very understandable that the Prophet said, do not let the woman travel alone, at a time when there were bandits between Mecca and Medina, and they were attacking every unprotected, you know, individual. Now, the idea would be safety, so you should infer the idea of safety of individuals, but if you say, a woman cannot drive an SUV today between Mecca and Medina, so you are actually taking something out of its context. So understanding the purpose of that law would be the key to understanding why maybe you should not implement it literally today. In Islamic uh, tradition, actually, this interpretation of law is known as the maqasid tradition. Uh, maqasid means the purposes, the intentions of Islamic law. And actually, it was Imam Shatibi, in the, uh, most of you probably know that, in the 15th century, who wrote uh, a theory of uh, the higher intentions of Islamic law. And he said, Islamic law, or the whole Sharia, actually can be explained by the... Uh, explained as the effort to protect five fundamental values. And these values are religion, well, life, <coughs> religion, the intellect, property, and lineage. Now, if these are the intentions of Islamic law, Islamic law actually becomes a universal law to protect individual rights uh, from aggression, from authoritarian governments. And let me say, let me add one thing there. That is actually why I b see the Sharia as a very sacred, very important idea for, m for Muslims as today. The Sharia is not a very popular concept in the West today, I, kn I know, you know. And there are obvious reasons, because we, uh, some Muslims you know, insist on implementing the Sharia literally through corporal punishments, you know, which, I, which I explain as a, as a part of a lack of prisons you know, in, in early Islam. Uh, it's a different, you know, uh, different so, uh, context, certainly. But there's something about Sharia. In European legal tradition, which comes from the Roman law, 
law was a creation of the state. For example, the Roman law begins by saying, the first thing it says is that it says the prince is about the law. So, since the prince makes the law, the law is designed to serve the government, to serve the state. Well, liberalism challenged that by natural law theory in Europe, and that has helped to some extent. But that's why you still, in European legal traditions, you have things like immunity, legal immunity, which comes from the idea that the guy at the top should not be questioned. Now, England is an exception to that, and I'll come to that. But in Islamic law, when you look, law is not designed by the ruler. Law does not come by the ruler. Law actually is a constraint on the ruler, because law ultimately comes from God. In the European natural law tradition, you have a similar idea, which you can see in the U.S. Constitution as well, or at least the Declaration of Independence. Law comes from God, and it is articulated by scholars who are independent from, from the sultans, from the rulers. So law is about protecting the rights of the individuals from the government. That's why the Sharia is all about the rights of the individuals. No one can steal, no one can, the government cannot steal your property, cannot confiscate your waqif. And that's how in, in Islamic tradition you have the civil society which emerged. Uh, which protected life, religion, property from oppressive rulers, basically. That balance, unfortunately, was lost in the 20th century as governments became very po powerful in the Middle East. In Turkey, for example, our modern state confiscated all waqifs, you know, all foundations. <laughs> and that modern age actually brought more authoritarianism to Turkey. And we had a similar modernizing uh, like trend in the Middle East. But anyway, if you look at Sharia from this perspective, if it's about the Maqasid, this actually becomes the equivalent of what the, what the West has been searching with liberalism in, in the West, which was insisting about you should protect individual rights from oppressive governments. And actually, there is an interesting theory uh, by uh, a late scholar, Maktisi, on the influence of Sharia in British legal tradition. Uh, and I you know, touch upon that in my book as well, uh, because of this. Yeah, OK, so three minutes. So I should quickly, so based on these ideas, in my book, I argue that we Muslims n need to look at Islamic law and culture from a more liberal perspective. And by liberal, I'm not saying we should buy something from the West. I'm saying we should have our own liberalism. In, in, we, should, we should have our own focus on freedom. Because if there's no freedom, if you can't choose to be a Muslim, if you cannot choose to be a pious Muslim, then there's no meaning to be a Muslim, then there's no meaning to be a pious Muslim. You should have the right to choose between going to a mosque and a bar. That should be your choice to go to a mosque, and that's why it's valuable. And to fellow Muslims, you should advise. But if you start to punish them for not going to the mosque, or if you start to punish them for doing things that you consider sinful, then actually you're imposing on them something which doesn't actually make them more religious. Mm. Based on that, I argue for a secular state uh, in my book, which will not impose any religiosity on the citizens, but which will respect their religiosity, and which will respect all their religious rights. And that's actually the consensus that we have come in Turkey. And today, the Islamic demand in Turkey is not an Islamic state, but a more liberal, democratic state. No one in Turkey wants to impose the hijab. We just want to, the non-hijab imposers to calm down and you know, just respect everyone's uh, standards. We, uh, another idea is this, what I call the freedom to sin, which is, again, not to condone sin, but if you try to ban people from sinning, you actually make them hypocrites, not genuine leaders, genuine believers. And the third idea that I say in my book, the last chapter, titled uh, Freedom from Islam, is the right to apostasy, because if we force people to remain in Islam forcefully, first of all, we are you know, uh, defaming our religion, and secondly, don't we have faith and trust in our religion? Why do we need authoritarianism to protect our religion? Are we that insecure? We should not be. I mean, if you are proud of Islam, which I hope all Muslims are, I'm sure all Muslims are, we should not need governments that will enforce those laws. We should be, we should be just trusting the power of our faith, which will come through reason, debate, discussion, and, and sharing our values. I think my time is over. Thank you so much, Shukran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaykum, Nabi Kareem Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi salihin. 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, thank you for attending and uh, apologies that you're all crammed here like sardines. Uh, the student union thought it would be helpful to tell us half an hour before the beginning of the event that the other rooms were double booked. So uh, we uh, may do. Um, I also like to thank Mr. Bakker for coming all the way from Turkey uh, to, to visit us. Um, I should have asked him to bring me some locking, but uh, next time. Um, it's a very interesting subject, this, you know, Islam and Reformation, because we, we hear it a lot and, and look how much interest it, it has brought, because uh, we, we, we've been bombarded with this idea that, you know, Reformation, Reformation. I, I mean, in essence, throughout the history of the Muslim world, throughout the history of, of scholarship, yeah, we've always gone back to our text and new ishtihads were done and uh, different opinions gleaned. But I think in this day and age, this idea of Reformation, and we know that it, from, the, from the Western perspective, it has it's a very loaded term because they use this... This, well, i.e., the concept they envision is to kind of uh, gut and fill it, uh, like they did Christianity and well, Judaism to some to some extent. Obviously, there are splinter groups, but they, to gut and fill it, Christianity, because I, I think their historical situation was they were fighting each other all the time. Uh, each prince uh, in Europe, you know, uh, had their own ideas about what kind of Christianity they should get involved in, and then they forced their populations, and they kind of uh, played off different factions of Christianity against each other, and so secularism was invented not to envision a uh, value-neutral society as we, as we supposedly have now, but rather to bring peace between Christians. Interestingly enough, when, when uh, you know, the clause in the American um, um, Declaration of Independence, I believe, there should be no establishment of church and state, or is it a constitution, I forget which, uh, wasn't actually that there shouldn't be no Christianity or Christian-based laws in America. It was, there, was no, there should be no institution of a particular church, a particular faction or sect, in America, because there's loads of, there's, there's, I think currently now there's about 15,000 different churches, and not, we're not talking about the, the building, we're talking about a faction or a sect or whatever you want, you want to define, it's quite a lot of, people, quite a lot of uh, difference of opinion. So secularism was initially envisioned to bring peace between um, you know, Christians, but I, I want to redirect it to the Muslim world, it's something very interesting in the Muslim world. Um, we have obviously Saudi and Iran, which always invoked uh, as examples or exemplars. Uh, of uh, Islamic law, but what most people don't understand is, and I think people that live there understand, and I think a lot of us that have research understand, is that obviously they're not actually based on um, Islamic law. Uh, obviously both Saudi and Iran have interest banking uh, as part of their system. I mean, you can go on BBC and, and monitor the, uh, the, the interest rates fluctuating in Saudi Arabia to control inflation and that it's the modern banking system. And of course, uh, we don't have a concept of monarchy uh, in Islam, and uh, the Iranian system, the Iranian ruling system, is very similarly, similarly modelled on the British system in a way. You have, you know, two houses and a, a supreme leader. Although uh, the Queen of England hasn't given any fatwas any time recently. <laughs> so, so anyway, Muslims are under a lot of pressure from a lot of these external uh, forces. I, I would say emanating from. Uh, the West, uh, they, don't, you know, they, they don't believe in Sharia, they don't believe in Islam, uh, and of course um, Muslims of various kinds uh, in the Muslim world. Uh, during the Cold, Cold War we had uh, communist Muslims who were trying to reconcile Islam with communism and saying that Islam you know, mandates communism, and, so, and, uh, and then there was rebuttals to them. And now the, obviously the, the dominating ideology is uh, liberalism of various shades, and so now we face a, a situation with that, and I would like to make a comment on these things. Now, um, unlike Isa alayhi salam, uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallam, established a community and a political authority in his lifetime. And from day one, uh, this enabled the Muslims to collectively preserve and maintain the Quran, and more pertinently to this discussion, his recorded sayings and examples which are used uh, in the Muslim community's laws and legislation. However, some historians want to revisit that, and with a skeptical mindset, and uh, try to find an alternative narrative. Now, the, the, the case is that, is there, a, is there really evidence for an alternative narrative? Was it just a, a mistake, the, the, or the accident of history, or just necessity, that the Prophet Muhammad sort of set up um, you know, a political system? Well, if you don't believe that the Prophet Muhammad is a Prophet Muhammad, so some, if, he, if he was a prophet, rather, and, he, and you don't believe that he was given revelation, then as a non-Muslim historian, you'd have to conclude that everything he did was based on uh, well, I, I, he made it up as he went along, as best he could. Whereas if, you, if you're a Muslim, as we all are, 
we all believe that uh, there was a, a plan, um, that the Quran was, was planned by God to, to be revealed in certain, uh, certain portions, and as problems arose, a hukum or a judgment was, was revealed to the Muslims, and it was uh, dealt with uh, these problems. So, if we take uh, non-Muslim um, historians, they will, of course, and not all non-Muslim historians, there's some very great, great ones, um, but uh, that's the otherwise. But a lot of uh, current sceptical non-Muslim historians like to portray uh, the Prophet Muhammad's endeavor as a very secular endeavor, and he just happened to bring a new religion, and he was a, p- a political leader uh, just on the side, so to speak. And this is, I think, far from the case. But without going to history, I think I'd like to discuss the main issue, which is we're discussing what is the way forward. And, I think the way, and so I think we have two parts. We can either intellectually revive uh, what we already believe in and um, obviously revisit, you know, revisit Ishtahad or, or, or jurisprudence. That's great. You can do that as many times as you want. The scholars did for about 1,400 years. Or we can uh, reconcile Islam with one of the existing st- status quo ideologies in the world. Well, communism is no longer uh, in vogue, but liberalism is. So what do we choose? Well, I would like to maybe present this choice uh, to you a bit more clearer in this, in this presentation as best I can. Let's look at liberalism. It's based on a very core idea, which is essentially individualism, um, and defined, and there's different definitions of it, but it's defined as a doctrine holding that the interests of the individual should take precedence over the interests of the state or social group. So basically, the individual is the main consideration. However, individuals are born into societies and are born into families. They don't create themselves. You you rely on your your mum's modest contribution to bring you into existence. Uh, The individual belongs to a species, uh, complete with specific instincts and organic needs. They do not choose their first language. uh, We depend on human beings to teach us. Language is a social construct, by the way. Uh, nor uh, we, we don't choose our nurtured characteristics when we were young, even growing up. Uh, we don't choose the, the habits that we acquire through our parents, siblings, society, genetics, or just random accidents. So individuals, and if you observe them, tend to conform to their host societies. So we all generally conform to the fashions of the society where we were brought up in. So any reason that we should regard the individual's own interest as being any more special than the environment that created him or her cannot be proven just by observing the individual philosophically. Any more than we can prove uh, that the cell is more important uh, than the body in a, in, a, in, a, in a human being or any being. Now let's, but let's look at what the Quran uh, views. How does the Quran view this, this, uh, this uh, issue, the aspect of individualism? Or how, how, what's its perspective? Well, some people have said that because on the Day of Judgment we'll be having one-to-one interviews, so to speak, with uh, God, uh, that we are uh, individuals. But there are, there's, a, there's a few problems with this, because there's all the eyes of Quran which say something a little differently, maybe a different perspective. For example, uh, you, God will bring you up by your leaders, he'll bring you up as nations, and, uh, and he'll uh, count you uh, together with your companions, with, your, with the people that you used to know. Um, you shall bear the sins of other people, who you might have influenced by your bad example in society. So even though you didn't do the sin specifically, but because you influenced that person, you bear their sins on your back. Uh, Human purpose is directed to worship that which is greater than the individual, obviously God, of course. And of course, uh, individuals in in, in the Quran are instructed to join collectives to cooperate uh, in the higher goals of, of, of this purpose. Uh, the Quran does detail collective punishments for nations in the hereafter, such as Far'un and other people. Collective punishments, a whole nation that was punished uh, in, in the hereafter, and, and, uh, and so on. Okay, it's not past tense, but it will happen. Um, individuals have responsibility uh, to their family, neighbors, brothers in faith, brothers in humanity, and to obey their leaders. Uh, both we know this from the Quran and in the Hadith. So this is now a responsibility to others, uh, and not just a concern on the individual. And as we know, that the Quran mandates uh, Qasas laws, which is um, a law to settle uh, kind of strife or conflict between different tribes. And in some cases, when two tribes fight each other, you don't know who the murderer is, so that the, uh, the aggressor tribe has to basically uh, you know, pick individuals of, of which what they will uh, be punished for the amount of individuals they killed in the victim's tribe. So that's not, but not necessarily the person who actually committed the crime. Or how, how would you know in a, tri- in a tribal fight? How would you know? Is, is punished. So there's, there's these kind of aspects. 
Um, we know again in the Quran that the successful individual is those who put others above themselves uh, in one, one, one ayat. Uh, going into the hadith narratives now, we see that the, the Muslims are like one body, and so the Ummah. Uh, Another compares uh, Muslims as supporting bricks of a building, we, uh, and of course, another uh, says that Muslims should wake, spend their waking moments thinking of the affairs of the greater Ummah, so on and so, so forth. Some people have said also that uh, the Prophet Muhammad advocated individualism because he detached people from their tribes. Uh, that they used to follow. That's true, but then he created a new one, which is the Ummah, and so they were actually aggregated into a new uh, tribal affiliation. So, these aspects are just, counter, uh, just some counter-examples. We are individuals, and we are collectives, and we are, so- we are social beings. Even cursory understanding of the, sci- of the, you know, of the brain, uh, neuroscience, we have mirror neurons, we now allows us to be empathic and feel other people's pain and, and suffering. So we're not actually uh, individuals any more than a cell is as part of the human body from one from one perspective. So uh, Islam embraces both the individual and the society, which, which is, makes it different from liberalism and different from communism. We're we're in between. Is Islam rights or duties based belief? Well, look at liberalism. Liberalism starts out from the basis of rights first. But, it, but does this make rational sense if you think about it? The universe, nature, and if illusion, if you, if you believe in evolution, doesn't respect our right to enjoy life uh, or even to live, uh, and doesn't even respect our rights to autonomy in many cases. So the universe, nature, everything around, if you're basically on, on a desert island with natural predators, are they going to respect your, your natural right to life? And if, you don't have, if they don't, then where is it in nature that you have this right? If you just think about it philosophically. Um, Allah does not treat us respecting our right to life or even pleasure. So he basically we suffer and uh, you know young ones die, and people with, with a liberal mindset say, oh how can God do this? And they call the problem evil, but but they they, they call the problem of evil because they start with an assumption that they have a, a right to entitlement. Which who who gave you that right to entitlement? Uh, you know God do, does as he pleases, uh, and so that's not it's not borne out by even the Islamic theology. Again, we see that the Quran portrays Allah as punishing people in this life and the next, uh, so not delaying, uh, not delaying punishment, uh, and it's done out of His mercy in, in a lot of cases. He, he has not obliged Himself uh, to, uh, to 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 basically give you mercy uh, or to give you pleasures in, in this in this life, uh, but He He will uh, punish those who commit sin. So those are aspects which, uh, would, if you would look at it in that philosophically, show that we don't really have any entitlements or rights uh, per se. If you want to look at it in that perspective. However, what, uh, what do we have? Well, actions originate from uh, one's, one's will, and uh, not from one's rights. So the will is the first cause for all accountable actions. It is assigned, uh, it should be assigned, what we must do, what we can do, what we shouldn't do. And this is the definition of duty. Duties exist as a result of our purpose. For our purpose is not to live life for ourselves, but according to Islam it is to worship God by submitting to the natural law that he defined for us as part of creation. All other purposes and bases for action are not protected and sanctified in Islam. It is only for the pursuit of duty that rights come into being. People only have the right to life because others have the duty to God to protect them and not to harm them. God has obliged himself to reward us for fulfilling our duties, but you can't, not fulfilling our rights. You, well, you can't really fulfill your rights, you can pursue your rights. But God rewards us for fulfilling our duties, and He makes it obligatory upon Himself. That's what He actually makes obligatory upon Himself. So um, Islam is most definitely a duties, a duties-based uh, uh, way of perspective, and not rights-based. Or you could say at least rights come into being after the duty has been established. And of course, in the Quran, it says, "Oh mankind, re- remain conscious of your duty to your Lord." So this is ex- this is how Islam views it. Now, Sharia and politics. Do we have the f- absolute freedom to sin? I mean, it is argued uh, that to free the individual, like liberalism does, or, or it, claims, it wants to do, I suppose, uh, we must get rid of social compulsion from the state, and that is sufficient to liberate the individual. However, liberalism does not get rid of social uh, compulsion from society. It actually exacerbates it, it, it by unleashing the actions of unscrupulous, influential people, corporations and groups to cause negative effects against social norms, allowing publicizing of life messages conveying, conveyed through advertising and film, like normalization of violence, casual sex and drugs, uh, which, which have become popular, um, reckless fashion uh, advertising, compelling women into unnatural requirements for, for beauty, leading to bulimia, anorexia, plastic surgery, uh, foot hurting high heels, which most women 
know, wear, and, uh, and revealing clothes, which, which you know, uh, women feel they, they need to feel, uh, you know, t- part of the society, and they, they all start adopting this. And not every single one, but certainly a lo- such a large majority that you must think to yourself, there must be a, some, something within the human being that socially compels them to conform to their society. And of course, the, uh, there's psychological impact of all this advertising and, uh, and uh, expression. At the subconscious level, so sexual objectification of women, for example, via fashion, music videos, selling products, using women, and of course, producing pornography. And of course, um, other, other dangers, such as mass prejudice and fascism, uh, by negative propaganda targeting communities, especially r- religious ones, under the guise of freedom to criticize religion. The Nazis advocated their, or rather, they demanded their freedom to criticize and express their opinions, and, and they used that to demonize the Jews, which then later on justified um, uh, a genocide. And, of, and, by, and finally, of course, and this is the most common one we all know about, economic compulsion of, of people into poverty uh, through allowing unethical profit-making ma- methods to affect the weakest uh, in society. And interest banking, fractional reserve system, stocks and shares broking, gambling, uh, you name it. Um, if you want some further research on this, uh, there's a great book called Supernormal Stimuli, How Primal Urges Overran Their Evolutionary Purpose by evolutionary psychologist Deirdre uh, Barrett of uh, Harvard, uh, Harvard Medical School. And she discusses all this stimuli which affects human beings, even subconsciously, so even without your consent. Uh, and a liberalism is meant to be all about your consent in theory. Now, Islam has a different view of society. It seeks to liberate human beings from negative social compulsion and alleviate all the obstacles in the way of the fulfillment of human purpose. So that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He will command upon them that which is right and forbid them what is wrong, and He will make lawful for them all the good things and prohibit for them all the bad things, and He will relieve from them the burden and the bonds they used to wear. So the actual prohibition of, of bad things and, uh, and advocating the, uh, the good things actually is meant to free us, not repress us. Now, the Sharia is not, okay, well, it's for everyone, but it's not for, uh, you could say, incorruptible saints. And it's not for incorrigible criminals. The, 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 the main people the Sharia is targeting is good intentioned people who are weak, which is most of us, if not all of us, unless anyone knows that there's a saint here, but, um, or an incorrigible criminal. But, <laughs> but it is actually for us, it's to help us. You know, the, the, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was described as the mercy to mankind. What mercy was giving us? What telling us Tawheed? Well, we could have gone to Judaism if you wanted um, monotheism. So what mercy did he give us? Well, he gave us a system that could liberate us from hurting each other emotionally, from being obstacles to each other's uh, development, and allowing us to actually realize our human purpose. Now, Islam doesn't tell you, you know, what to believe if you're a Jew or Christian or whoever, and it doesn't control your life. It allows individuals to make a free choice to sin in the privacy of their own home. You can do what you want. You can drink alcohol, you can take drugs. Uh, Caliph Omar bumped into a guy, well not bumped into a guy, but actually uh, peered over a guy's uh, wall, saw a guy in his own house drinking alcohol and entertaining a lady of uh, disrepute, and didn't punish the guy. In fact, the guy actually rebuked him for daring to peek, peek into his house. So Islam doesn't care about what you do in the privacy of your own home. But it does care of public advertised sins which affect society, which affect social conscience. Uh, anyone read social constructivism? Uh, or any that, that kind of subject will, will, will know a lot about that, about how things done in public affect uh, public perception and public uh, psychology. And what the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, he used a very great example to express how Islam deals with society. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful example. He says, the example of the person abiding by Allah's order and restrictions in comparison to those who violate them is like the example of people who drew lots uh, for their seats on a ship. Some of them got the upper, upper deck seats, and some of them got the lower deck. And when the latter needed water, so when the lower deck needed water, they had to go up to the top to get water from the side. But if they said to themselves, let us not trouble those on top, by, uh, and let us make a hole for our part of the ship to get water directly. If those on top let them do so, they would all be destroyed. But if those on top prevented them from doing so, they would all be saved. And this is, uh, this is in, a, in one beautiful hadith, uh, sums up the, the, the entire share of view of society. So, it, it's not that Islam doesn't give uh, individuals rights, as I said, well, well, it's based on Jews, of course. It gives society rights too. 
So we're not like we're not liberal and we're not communist. Communists, there's no individuals; they're just society. We're in between. Islam is the is the balance way. It's always the middle way uh, in in that respect. So this is it's quite, something quite beautiful. And Islam believes uh, in applying law on society. Um, so when it says in the Quran, those who, if we establish them in the land, they establish regular prayer, give regular charity, and enjoin the right and forbid the wrong, using the, the terms amr, for, you know, amr bil maruf or nahi munkar. Amr, in Arabic, it doesn't mean to preach or to ask people, oh, could you, could you, do, could you do good? Amr, from the same term amir, is order, command. It is amir, like a leader. And of course, nahi is uh, you know, forbid or to, to prescribe or to prohibit, uh, again in an authoritative sense. And the Quran picks its words very, very specifically. And as we know, uh, there are things that we can't deny, uh, in, 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 no matter how we, you know, we, revisionist we might want to, to go. The Quran does give laws that it wants to apply in society. So uh, the punishment for, the, for theft, committing Ill- Ill- illicit sexual intercourse, and of course, unsubstantiated accusations of adultery, and even, of course, uh, highway robbery uh, or, or causing uh, corruption on the land. So Islam has penal laws. The Quran itself has penal laws for society. It's not an accident of history or uh, some person invented a hadith 200 years after the Prophet Muhammad made and made it up. It's part and parcel of the Quran. So if the Quran has this, then why not have um, other laws which might not be inside the Quran? And there are laws that we follow outside the Quran all the time, like how to pray, which is not mentioned in the Quran at all. Right? So this is something very interesting. And of course, you can't punish a poor person for committing theft. Does the Quran say that? No. The hadith says that. We need to rely on the hadith to actually tell us, to actually rein back the Quran's injunction to not, not punish every person that commits theft, but actually those who fit seven conditions, again, come from, coming from hadith. People use uh, the term, there is no compulsion in deen, to say that uh, an Islamic state cannot compel people uh, with regards to anything that Islam mandates. So if Islam prohibits an interest, it can't stop you because there's no compulsion in deen. But deen means two things. Deen can either mean... Uh, belief or religion, that's the root word to what you profess, and it can mean uh, to uh, uh, owe allegiance, obey, to condemn or pass judgment. Yom Adin, yeah, day of what? Day of religion? Day of belief? No, it's the day of judgment. Deen, same word. So why do we uh, take it out of context? That verse, there's no compulsion to Deen, is that you don't force people to be a Muslim, and you don't, you don't force people uh, against their will regarding the issue of belief. However, there's not a verse of Quran which says, and fight them until there is no more oppression, and the Deen is for Allah. Now, if we say that the Deen means religion here, then that means that we have to compel everybody to be, uh, to, to have a Deen for, for Allah. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, we, should stop, we shouldn't stop fighting. But what it means is that the judgment is for Allah. So, eliminate oppression until the judgment the laws which are which will be fair and just will be the uh, you know the laws which um, Allah has given to, for humanity to free us. Now, um, even liberals believe in compulsion, so they, they believe in state law. So there is such a thing as as uh, state law, which will what co- will coerce you to do the right thing. See, so they say that yeah, humans should decide for themselves. But then why don't you um, be consistent? Like anarchists, they're um, a madhab of liberalism, a school of thought of liberalism. They're very consistent. They say, yep, it, human beings should be left to ourselves to make moral and mature decisions about how we treat each other. But liberals realize many, uh, 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 from the works of Thomas Hobbes, that that doesn't work. People need the coercion to stop them from hurting each other. So why is there a problem with Islam um, having some, some degree of effect? Now, I'm not saying Islam will force you to be a pious person. Again, you don't have to be. But it prevents you from committing corruption in public that might um, you know, uh, poison society. Now, pe- uh, uh, people say that, w- w- what about hypocrisy? You know, that how do you deal with people who, are, uh, who will be false Muslims in public? Well I'll, well, I'll tell you what, we'll deal with it the same way the Prophet Muhammad dealt with it. You can tell in the Quran that people didn't know who the hypocrites were. And the hypocrites were worried that the Quran, a revelation, would come down and out them in public. You see, I prefer the hypocrites to be in their homes doing their, doing, uh, their hypocrisy than outside, bringing it into, to, to, you know, in, in, our, in, our, in the public square and corrupting our children, our, our families, uh, ourselves and so on. So this is, so uh, the argument for hypocrisy, thank you, the argument for hypocrisy is not, is not valid. Um, other aspects, that may perhaps what I'd like to bring. Systems don't change. Technology changes. Public opinion changes. But systems don't change. 
Democracy is 2,500 years old. It predates Islam. Yet, if you, if you don't believe in democracy, you're not considered to be modern. It's very interesting. It's very interesting that my, my, my time is running out. Um, just one, one, one more minute or yeah, just, just, just uh, quickly. But in Islam, we believe that yeah, the Sharia must be applied, but, you, but and the, the people can't vote on what Sharia or they, they have, but they can vote on the leader. And the liberalism believes exactly the same. You can't vote out liberalism in any liberal country. You're not even told to vote for, for what system you want. Yeah, people don't realize the American Constitution was, in, was brought into being because the people couldn't be trusted. Look at the, what the American Founding Fathers said about that, James Madison uh, and, all, and all these various other individuals. They understood that uh, you couldn't just let people decide any, everything uh, willy-nilly because uh, the tyranny of the majority was, was a, a very big worry, tyranny of the mob, um, as Thomas Jefferson said. So why do they say, oh, look at Islam. If you guys are going to power, you know, we couldn't vote on, on Sharia. I say, yeah, well, you can't vote, we can't vote on liberalism. So it, it's fair, right? It's equal. So where's the, where's the problem? And then the last point is they'll say, uh, some people say that if we establish an Islamic system or, or state, uh, which, which interpretation of Islam? Which interpretation, you know, that will cause trouble and problems. Well, it didn't historically, uh, but what people don't tell you is liberalism has 14 different political schools of thought and 10 schools of Aqidah, i.e. on what is individualism and definition of individualism. They, uh, and this is just the main ones. There's actually even many smaller ones. They have even more schools of thought and difference of opinion than Islam, yet we are told that it's impractical to implement Islam because we have difference of opinion. So this is, I think, the, the hypocrisy of what they say, but uh, I haven't said um, uh, everything I wanted to say. But generally speaking, I think there's a case that we should, that for us to revive our belief instead of changing our belief or, to, uh, or imitating other, other political philosophies. And I think that if we revisit with an open mind uh, what the texts say and with a, with a historical, uh, a critical mind as well, uh, we can re revive a deen that will change the Middle East and change and, and uproot these authoritarian re regimes and bring a true regime that represents uh, what the Muslims uh, want and will help us uh, to, to fulfill our purpose uh, to God. Thank you. I listened to Abdullah's presentation very carefully and found it very well articulated and found it very interesting. And some of the arguments he you know, implicitly refuted were my arguments, partly, so I, I found it very helpful. Let me say a few things. Prophet Muhammad founded a state. Yes. Prophet Muhammad was a prophet. And none of us are prophets. None of us are revealing revelations. None of us are divinely guided. So we don't have the mandate that Prophet Muhammad had. Even at the time of Prophet Muhammad, there are incidents like this. He makes a decision before the Battle of Badr. He says the army should camp here. And one of the Sahaba comes and asks him, Ya Rasulullah, is this your opinion? Or is this a revelation from God? And when Prophet says, this is my opinion, then he says, well, with all due respect, respect, I think we should do it differently. And the Prophet listens to him. There's another episode about Prophet Muhammad. People ask him about his idea about date farming. He, give, he gives an advice. The advice doesn't work. And people ask him, and he says, well, I'm just a human being. I don't know that issue. So I think, based on such reasoning, my argument and argument of some other people is that not everything the Prophet Muhammad did is divinely guided. Some of it is historical. So he got a revelation, and he, he, of course, with the best of his morality and wisdom, followed a lot of things. But some, are his, some of them are historical phenomena, which may be not necessarily repeated all the time. The, the structure of his political entity, the state, it's a historical phenomena. I mean, it's, it was a city-state in Medina. Should Muslims have city-states forever? Well, when Prophet Muhammad passed away, Muslims discussed what to do. There was no revelation telling that there should be a caliphate. They said, well, let's choose one of us as a successor, and that's how the institution of caliphate was founded. And for example, Abdullah, you said there is no institution of monarchy in Islam. Well, Muslims for 13 centuries did not think that way. I mean, there were monarchies. They said, this is fine. They just wanted to give an Islamic color to those monarchies. And today, in the modern world, republics are fashionable. Well, you have a monarchy, which is good. 
<laughs> but so things these from my perspective state structures political structures entities change but islamic values and standards live and we can have a we can, we can but if we claim that any of these are islamic we are fooling ourselves there's an islamic republic of iran there's an islamic kingdom of saudi arabia there's an Islamic, there was a tribal confederation in Afghanistan. Not all of, none of them are, from my point of view, Islamic. These are just states founded by Muslims with their flaws and mistakes and sometimes, you know, uh, blessings. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, as for the other, shortly, I also think that you have, you said there are different versions of liberalism, and I'm not in favor of having a liberalism and fitting Islam into it, but one, two things. I would compare Islam to Christianity or Judaism, not liberalism and communism. These are political systems, well-designed, detailed political systems. I don't think Islam is a political system. Uh, Islam has political values and principles. It would guide the political sphere, but I mean, communism is just whole structure. I mean, Islam doesn't do that, and I think that's the beauty of Islam. It just doesn't give it end, like a political system for that. For you, that's one thing. Secondly. You generally criticize secular liberalism, which begins with the idea that the individual is responsible to nobody, including God, right? Well, that's the liberalism that I would certainly not agree with. The liberalism that I would find close to me is the liberalism which says, since there's a God, and since there's no other Lord than God, I'm first and foremost responsible to God, and in the afterlife, as you said, you will be judged based on your personal deeds. So, you're not, your responsibility to the state, your responsibility to the community, cannot destroy your individual self. And you have duties and rights, but the state should respect your rights. You know your duties. I know my duty is fasten, to fast in Ramadan. Yeah. I don't want the state to tell me that my duty. I just want the state to respect my rights to organize my life in the way that I want. That's why I think a liberal state structure, by definition, is not something unacceptable for Muslims. Like, good monarchies were not unacceptable in the 8th century. So, cool. just, okay, great. What would you like to uh, yeah, respond? Yeah, sure, sure. No, I want to thank you for those uh, um, rebuttals and, and discussions. Um, what I would say is this. Islamic scholarship is already aware and has delineated where the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam discussed a policy of a battle and a strategy or, and where he was instituting a law. Uh, we have a, a concept of uh, Illa and Karina, uh, so what, what, how we know something is decisive or how we know something is, is in, in contextual or not. So we, Islamic scholarship already has these tools so um, I don't say that we should, um, you know, if we fight a battle, we must use exactly the same strategy that Prophet Muhammad saw some use and on the day of Badr, for example. We all know this, and, and no, one's, no one's saying this, so that, it's, it's, it's a straw man in that aspect. But what we do see today is um, that everybody, so these lawmakers that we vote into to power, they uh, have put it upon themselves, or rather, or rather they've taken it from you, uh, that they have the right to interpret the spirit of the law uh, as they see fit from their personal opinion and then uh, enact that law and if you break that law then you will face the consequences so literally you're going to be punished for someone's opinion uh, in, this, in, this, in this society so uh, that happens and that's normal statecraft but again when Muslims do it or when Islam uh, mandates it it's, it's, it's oh this is against freedom or against liberalism but liberalism does the same that, that's my point so why are we uh, you know uh, why do we have a problem with that um, the Prophet Muhammad saw some forbade interest, for example. H how is that contextual? You know, interest is practiced all over the place. Uh, I think one example was people said that at the time of the Prophet Muhammad saw some there was slavery, and now there is no slavery, so the Muslims have now already abolished that law. No, we haven't abolished the law, uh, the, the law for, for regulating slavery and preventing um, uh, the slaves from being abused. But if slaves were well, somehow, we, let's say we conquered a land and there were slaves again in the 21st century, the law will come back into effect to regulate and protect the slaves' rights. You see, so that the law hasn't been abolished, there's just no more slaves uh, that, that we need to protect anymore, which is a good thing. That, that's great, and I hope there will, never, there will never be any more slaves, although in the modern world there is uh, debt slavery and wage slavery. It's a new kind of slavery which we have to deal with, and it doesn't come from an Islamic source. Um, um, other aspects, like, it, it's a deliberate, just a political ideology, and you can't compare it. 
But liberalism encompasses, uh, you know, there's epistemological liberalism. So there's people who basically um, uh, apply it in, uh, in how, in, like, skepticism and applying it in, in the arts. And uh, they're, they're, it's basically every aspect of human culture, uh, there is a, a, a kind of liberal mindset for it. So they have an answer for everything, for every aspect of human life, how, um, how you approach even knowledge or epistemology, how you know something is true, how you test things. Uh, liberal scholarship, when they look at the Bible, they look at it critically and they are skeptical. And they call it liberal scholarship. Why do they call it that? You, you study it, you're in SOAS, you guys know what they call liberal scholarship on certain books. Why is that? Because, oh, it's methodological skepticism. This is, uh, or, and free thinking and all these other aspects which are considered to be part and parcel of liberalism and again communism had their own way of thinking as well their own dialectical materialism their own way of looking at uh, the world but that's a different discussion um, as for the individual well, I'll I tell you this if you're, I mean, we know this the Prophet Muhammad said that if, if you see uh, an evil you know, then try and change it with your hand so it's not, if, it's not that if you're not doing that evil and then, you know, then fine, leave it alone. No, that you have a responsibility to face evil and change with your hand or speak out. If you, if you can't, if you literally can't do that, if you won't ch- do anything, then just speak out against it. And if you literally are prevented from doing that, uh, then just hate it in your heart. So there are responsibilities that go beyond the individual in Islam. And, and that's what I'm trying to argue uh, here is that we, uh, you know, the, uh, I believe the, uh, it's certain from many Islamic texts that the believers are helping friends from one another. We help each other. Now, as I said, if you want to drink alcohol, you can go to your house, you're fine to do that. If you want to wear skimpy clothing, you can go to your house and, and do that. Your husband will probably be very, very appreciative. But don't, uh, don't bring that outside with you. Why should everyone else have to now bear the burden of your decision to go do whatever you want and now be, be bombarded with unsolicited you know, sexual uh, images and stimuli? That's not fair. That's not fair in society. They still have public decency laws in this country, which emanates from the Christian, uh, the Christian legacy laws, public decency laws. So again, in the modern Western states, they still have this, but uh, again, the, under, the definition of what is decent uh, has been somewhat watered, de- watered down, uh, unfortunately. So, so those are the main aspects. Um, I'll finish off with, did the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam leave behind a, a model state that we should follow? And people often try to challenge that concept and say, no, no, he didn't, he didn't, uh, I don't see it anywhere in the Quran. You, it is not only in the Quran, it's in uh, an unbelievable amount of uh, narratives attributed to the Prophet Muhammad So we see in the Quran, it said, oh David, when we made you a Khalifa in the land, so judge between the people and with truth and justice, and do not pursue their vain desires. I think in a repetition of democracy, really, they don't even pursue the desires of the people, but rather uh, in rule with justice and uh, truth. Khalifa. And again, there is uh, numerous hadiths on this very same issue, uh, where the Prophet Muhammad said that um, uh, uh, in this religion, we want the, the, their judgment won't come until there's been 12 caliphs. So within this deen, there'll be, uh, the last day won't come until there'll be 12 caliphs. This has been narrated uh, as mutawatir. There's like so many chains of narration, uh, you know, so many chains of narration. Uh, every single Islamic school of thought agreed on that, that the Prophet Muhammad said this. So the Prophet Muhammad was conscious that there would be a khalifa uh, after him, and there'd be even 12 khalifas who were from the Quraysh in that particular uh, narration, which is a prophecy. And, and there are, again, there are many, many other uh, hadiths uh, about, you know, the tribe of Israel used to have prophets rule over them one after the other. There'd be no prophets after me. The people asked, uh, uh, you know, what will come afterwards? They said there'll be there'll be khulafa, and they asked, you know, what, what do you command us to do regarding these khulafa, these these caliphs? They say, give the bayah, give your pledge of allegiance to each and every one of them. And um, yeah, so so basically, we see that the concept of caliphate is part and parcel of the deen. Uh, everyone, including the Mutazilites, which he was mentioning in his book, uh, believed it was actually a pillar of the deen as well. So there is no dispute on this issue. I don't see why we should bring up to dispute it again. It's great to check, check our facts, it's always good to check your facts, but it's part and parcel of Islam, the, uh, and you know, the Muslims uh, have, are entitled to, uh, uh, to basically implement this injunction, which is the only system that we've ever known, and has produced for us uh, the kind of state and society that protected us and gave us um, our, our human needs and helped develop the Muslim society to be, uh, again, as I said, fulfill their purpose and to, to worship God. Great. I want to give an ideological situation. Both of these two guys are leaders, right? Okay, and I want to know what, 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 okay, okay, we're talking about liberalism, we're talking about re, um, revive our belief and revisit, etc, 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 but how does that manifest into a, a, a form of government or a form of political, I don't know, um, authority that we all live 
like you, that you can govern a, a nation or a community. How what, you know? How is it manifesting? Because we started with Brother Mustafa last time. Um, I want to start with Brother Abdullah. Um, so just, I mean, how what, how what you're saying? How how do you put that into fruition? I mean, sure, sure. Okay, well, let's let's take it from the theory into the practical because that's, that's that's what we really want to know. Okay, firstly, um, is there support? So I mentioned, okay, this is caliphate in essence, which is um, a, an orthodox Muslim opinion uh, for 1,500 years. So, okay, that's been mentioned, that's fine. But what do we mean by this? How do we achieve this? You know, is there support for this? Well, we know that you know, the University of Maryland did a, a, a poll in 2007 and again in 2009, and they basically found that in the in following countries such as um, uh, Egypt, uh, Pakistan and Morocco, around 70% of the people wanted not only Sharia law, they wanted caliphate and the unification of Muslim lands into that, into that state and system. But the question is, um, how, now how do we achieve this? Now, this is a, a, perhaps a, a, a very big discussion, but I'll start with this very something very simple from how it actually works. In essence, the Muslims come together and we uh, have an election of some kind to select a leader from a list of candidates who have a proven background and not being unjust and not being corrupt and not being lying and so on and so forth. And from these candidates, we don't ask what policies they're going to follow. They don't have a choice in what policies they implement. They have to implement what the, the Sharia says, and the Sharia gives us uh, basically rights that they have to fulfill. So our rights uh, to food, clothing, and shelter, for example, health care, education, and basically uh, an intellectual life. So we, we, we have the right not to feel scared to actually voice our opinions in the Muslim world. A lot of, in a lot of countries, we are scared. And Islam gives us the right to actually speak out. So the Khalifa, what he does, so when this person is instituted, he will implement the Sharia. And he will implement it based on either his ishtahad, if, if he's a, a mushtahid, a scholar. Most likely he won't be, so he'll have either uh, scholars which uh, he work for him. Uh, or, more likely, you'll have scholars who are independent of the state, like what happened in history, and he would go and consult them, and they would uh, basically, after evaluating the situation I did, they would give a ruling. He'd have no decision in that matter, and he would implement the law uh, devoid of, of that ruling. Now, this is, in essence, a very, very simple, but it, it works very effectively. Because, rationally speaking, whatever system you want to devise, there's always going to be a head guy. Even in democracy, there has to be a chairman or a president or prime minister. You can't escape the rational uh, result that there is always a head person in any ruling system. And so, whether you want to call him Khalifa or Imam or Sultan, that's up to you. you know, the name is not important in Islam. Um, you know, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that obey even a, uh, a kind of like a disfigured uh, ex-Abyssinian slave, uh, as long as he governs over you according to the Book of God. So that's the criteria. So it doesn't matter what you want to call him, uh, that will be the case. It'll be one leader elected by the people and will be accounted by the people. So if the leader goes wrong, if the leader implements something which is not Islamic, and the people have by rights to either the constitutional court will take him up and depose him of power, like uh, the Sheikh al-Islam in the Ottoman state did a number of times, as you probably know about, very effectively the caliph you know, the Ottoman Caliph Sultan was ejected uh, at least, I counted at least 10, 11 times by the Sheikh al-Islam or the, 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 the constitutional judge evicting that, that Sultan. So we have accountancy measures, we have uh, a, a press which is a, which is a free press but not a press that can publish, you know, nude, you know, uh, kind of uh, chest of women, uh, you know, uh, on, on every day and that kind of stuff that you see in the kind of newspapers you get in the UK. There is limits of propriety but apart from that opinion is allowed and debate is allowed, and intellectual discussion is allowed. That's not a problem. So I want to make sure that uh, the, the opinion of those people who basically advocate the issue of caliphate, which is basically 70% of the Ummah, is not mis uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, maligned, because that's what you get, unfortunately, in the media, is that we're portrayed as some kind of Taliban. And every single person that believes in the caliphate must be a Taliban. And they use that as a pejorative to actually prevent you from actually understanding what actually Islam actually uh, orders in these, in these situations. So in a nutshell, that's the system, that's the state. All you need is, is, all you need is a single country of, of, with um, the people behind it and uh, a coup of some kind, um, as, 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 as bloodless as possible. Um, so that the ruling regime, the people that the Ahl Hal will act, the people of power, uh, or the people that hold the power, uh, facilitate the, 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 the change into the uh, 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 caliphate system where the elections will be set up, people will choose their leader, and the leader will implement the Sharia to the best of his ability. And I'll finish up with. Will an the pastors will be killed. Sorry? By the way, will the pastors okay, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second then. The <laughs> Uh, that's a Richard Dawkins argument um, <laughs> it, it, on, that BB, on that TV show. He goes, um, I have no other question, just one question. <laughs> Will apostate. No, anyway, um, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu spoke to a judge and advised him that, you know, uh, 
basically the, 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 the judge wanted to know what he should do if someone comes to him for judgment. So he said, make judgment. If it's not in the Quran, then you go to the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And if you can't, then you exert uh, you know, legal jurisprudence to do so. Make Qiyas in one version, all the, all the versions come up in each heart. So the Prophet Muhammad allowed, mandated us as, as simple non-profit Muslims to do ijtihad based on his sources and if we get it wrong, we get one reward from God anyway. But it doesn't negate the authority of that ruling, you see? So we don't need a prophet to run everything, um, uh, you know, we actually just, we, we can be human and run it as long as we run it to the best of our ability and with sincerity, that's all that matters. And I think that's kind of much. Oh, your, your question about the, the oh, apostate. The apostate. Just, yeah. All right. To, to provoke you. No, that's fine. Um, <laughs> with I like, all the respect. No, no, that's, that's, that's fine. No, um, I have a bit of atheist, so I'm, I'm used to uh, uh, questions uh, that, that, that ask that, that kind of subject. I'm not on that side. No, so. no, that's all right. I know, no, 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 uh, you know, to be his career in Turkey, he, he debates uh, people on uh, atheism and so yeah. on. And this, he, uh, he takes them up on it. That's quite good. Um, in Surah 4, Ayah 88, it discusses, I think, what is in, in essence um, the, the, the issue closest to apostasy. And in essence, it's renegade or uh, treason. So if someone who commits treason against the Muslim community, if, if you leave your, your religion and you basically leave uh, the Muslim state, uh, no one will follow you, no one will come down and hunt you. Uh, all the examples that we can find, the Prophet Muhammad uh, basically encountered apostates, so a Bedouin guy who wanted to recount his, his uh, Pledge of Allegiance. He left Medina, no one hunted it down. There's an example mentioned in your, in your book as well, uh, regarding uh, two Byzantine Christians who converted uh, uh, to, uh, the sons of a, of a companion. The companion was distressed because they were taking his son to, to, to Byzantine Rome. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, you know, I don't like him to leave them. And then the Ayah of came down, there's no compulsion in Deen. So you're free to convert and go to an er uh, you know, Ahl al Dimmi, an area where there's basically non-Muslims and you can join your community of Christians if you became a Christian or join your community of Jews if you became a Jew. Um, there is no punishment, no one's going to come after you and hunt you. So it seems to me that what Sharia is basically prohibiting is treason against, uh, against the state. So I would, I would concur on that. And again, uh, Sura uh, for uh, Ayah 88 uh, bears witness to that. So that's my, my answer to that point. Thank you. Sure. Abla, as, you're, as I understand, you're envisioning a global Islamic state under an elected caliph. Yeah, in, in okay. essence, yeah, a ca caliphate. Well, that, I, I, I mean, I respect your point of view. Uh, that presupposes a goal which says Muslims should be a political u unity. Yeah. Well, I don't agree with that. It has never been that way. After Prophet Muhammad, actually, it just took two, even a decade to have the first civil war among the Sahaba. You know, Ali versus Aisha, you know. Uh, but I mean, and after the first four caliphs, you had all these princes, all these different school states. All sorts of things. I mean, the Ottoman Empire was a big caliphate. The Ottoman Empire did not cover all Muslim lands. The Ottomans fought other Islamic princes and you know states and uh, city states and regional states. There was a Mughal Empire. There was Iranians all the time. So it's the Islamic Ummah has never been a politically united entity. Is this an accident of history? Is it something we should correct today? I don't think so. I think Islamic. The Islamic community was politically unified only when there was Prophet Muhammad. Because only his authority could be unchallenged by all Muslims. I mean, if you're a Muslim, but you, by definition, you should obey Prophet Muhammad. But after Prophet Muhammad, well, according to Shia, the whole, actually, the third, first three caliphs that we regard as rightly guided are not legitimate. According to Harijites, no, none of them are legitimate. <laughs> According to Sunnis, you know, the first are fine, but then Muawiyah comes and things go bad. And there has never been this political unity. And I also do, so it is his, I mean, because we are humans, we have different ideas. You say, I mean, Muslims will agree on a particular understanding of Sharia. It has never been this way. And under the caliphs, Actually, there were few times that the caliphs decided what the Sharia should be. Actually, under the caliphs, it was all pl plural. I mean, in the, under the Abbasids, you could be a Mutazila, you could be a Shia, you could be a Hanafi, you could be a... Because there was no centralized law. So the problem is that in the modern world, we're living in states which have centralized laws. 
So if we say this will be the Islamic State, we will make one of our Islamic laws, the Islamic law of the Hanafis or the Hanbalis or the modernists or the neo mutazila or the Shia or the Wahhabis or the Salafis, which of them will be the... I mean, we will agree. Well, no one has agreed on that throughout history. And I think this, we Muslims have to agree to disagree on our understandings of Islam. We are a faith community. There are Muslims all over the world, here from to Bangladesh to... I think there is no reason why we should envision them as a unified political community. Uh, this is just a fact of life. But what Muslims should do in the modern age? Well, we need better economies, we need better education for our societies, we need more dialogue and cooperation, of course, it, within different members of the Ummah. Uh, but it is not just having a centralized state. I mean, Soviet Union had the world's biggest centralized state. It just collapsed because it didn't give people the freedom to interact and so on. So I think this idea that a state will save us is wrong. We have states. I mean, we, inter inter we have a state. It's getting better. We're working on it. You know, we still have problems. But even in Turkey, nobody can agree on. For example, in, in Turkey, the one, one good thing about Turkey, uh, I'm very much against our particular secularism in Turkey, which is hostile to religion. I mean, the Kamala secularism is toward, it's based on hostility towards religion. I'm against all such secularist states. But a neutral secular state is in Turkey what all Islamic communities now agree. Because in Turkey, if we say, let's have an Islamic state, will it be according to the Naqshbandis, according to the Nurjus, according to Gulen movement, according to the other Iranian-inspired Islamists? So, the, well, everybody, but we've discussed that all for a long time. And someone said, ultimately, let's just have a neutral state. You know, Let's just do the, the things in our own civil sphere. And I think that's the, if we would have an Islamic state, we would fo fo we'll fight for that, as was the case in Pakistan. You know, the Islamization of laws in Pakistan created a lot of problems because the community did not own what law is. So I think we should just look. I think Islam is a faith community. The Ummah is a faith community. We share the same faith, but we talk different languages. We have different political histories. We have different cultures. We should only work to for the betterment of those cultures. And I think we don't need this kind of centralized big state, which will you know, which will be a very unexpected thing in world history. Okay. Okay. respond to that. Um, I didn't say anything about centralization. Uh, when the when the caliphate came about, there was governors appointed to each region to uh, uh, minister each region autonomously. In fact, that was sorry. When you can't hear, I'll say sorry. Um, when uh, in the in the early caliphate, there were governors appointed to different regions. Uh, to actually administer each region. In fact, it was so effective that some had their own private army and uh, then bickered and, and they started to split because of that. So it actually was so, it was because it was too decentralized uh, that it actually led to some splits at the beginning. But uh, just because there were splits now and again in, in, in Islamic history doesn't mean now we should now change our what the Islamic ideal to fit uh, you know, accidents of history. That, that's, now, that's what I was talking about. Now we, we're trying to change our, our, uh, our belief and, and eliminate our ideals. You know, in my area part of the world, Portugal uh, and, and Spain, the Al Muahidun uh, were Berbers from North Africa, and they came to help uh, the Muslims in Al Andalus against the encroaching uh, Crusaders. And Yusuf bin Tashfin, when he actually uh, had reconquered all the areas which were just Muslim, uh, 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 the uh, bickering city states, he sent a message to the Caliph in Baghdad, saying, "I get here's my bayah. I this is I give this governorship. Uh, as I, I reintegrate it back into the Caliphate, basically." So he understood, the Muslims understood back then that, they, that we can't be divided amongst ourselves. The Quran says, do not be divided amongst you, hold fast the rope of Allah. Um, and in this day and age, it's even easier to actually implement a caliphate because communication is much, is much more easy, quicker. You can get from one part to the other, other part within 24 hours. Whereas back then, it almost took a year from one extension to the other extension. So it's actually, technology has made uh, the Sharia easier to, uh, to implement. And I, as I said, if we just resign ourselves to separate states which were created after uh, the colonialism, and then we will never amount to anything. We will just be bickering, fighting, uh, be prone to be used one, one against the other, much like the state of Jahliya, which when the Prophet Muhammad encountered Yathrib, there was two tribes fighting each other, and he united them under Islam. So what I'm saying is we should unite under Islam too. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll repeat what I said earlier on before. 
He said that, which school of thought will you follow? And I said, in the West, do they say, oh, David Cameron's a conservative. Oh, I'm a liberal Democrat. Let's rebel and fight against him. No, they don't. Why is that? Why can't we do that? Yeah, if they can do that, then what's, what's wrong with us doing that? And traditionally, the, the Ottoman Caliph was Hanafi, and he had Shafi subjects, and they didn't say, oh, you're, you're not Shafi, we won't, we won't bear you. They followed. And you know why? It came from the principle of uh, the Imam in the Salah. When you do your Salah, you, you're, you're told you have to recite you know, a, a surah, and you can't you know, cut the surah halfway. But if the Imam end, finishes the end of the surah before you, and says, Allahu Akbar, you have to stop what you're doing, and, uh, and bow down. Mm. And this is how uh, the Imam unites the people. And it's, and, it, and it's basically interesting, the Imam is the same word for prayer leader as it is for the head of state. So this is the Islamic model. It's, it's not only feasible, it's more feasible now mm. than it ever was before. And I think it's the only uh, model and system that will give true security and true cooperation to the Muslim lands. Okay, thank you brother. Okay, so I, I know you guys have been waiting for this part to pick our speakers' his brains. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to open up the floor, inshallah. Wow, hands are ready. Did you see that? I didn't even finish saying what I was saying and people are putting my behind already. It's great. So, okay, so I'm going to open up the floor and um, I'll take three questions at a time. As you, as you as, wish. Yeah? As you wish. As you, as you wish. As you Just we should we allow you to keep them in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. One per person, not. <laughs> Sorry? And keep one, one per person. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. One per person. And uh, be specific if you want both of them to answer or just to brother or just to brother. Okay. One, two, three. So, okay, stop. Stop. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum uh, I'm Harjim Singh. I'm the chair of Bexley and the Greenwich Multi Faith Forum. Right. I'm. Um, it was a quite uh, long decision, you know, to come over here, because what I feel is, and the learned speakers can uh, probably convince me and answer me, that unless and until we listen to other people in a calm fashion, we are not going to learn, right? And it's wonderful to see brothers and sisters in Islam, right, in hundreds here, but they should have been other faiths as well. Because what happens is, what happens is, would you or would you not agree that you are seeing all these excellent things about Quran, about Islam. Right? I know Islam means, you know, peace, because I've read about it, right? I've taught about it in the schools. But if you go out and ask someone what the Islam is, right, the normally working class teenagers, white teenagers would say it means halal, killing and beating up, right? Exactly in the same way, if I ask them, what is Christianity? I tell you what they say, because they don't know about Christianity either, right? So they will say, Christianity is Christmas, Jesus, and mince pie and presents, <laughs> right? No, you believe it, it's as simple as that. That's what they would say, right? So I agree with you 100%. There is no such thing as liberalism, mm. right? It's a question of might is right, mm. right? I tell you, now they are saying about hijab. When I came here in 65, yeah. they talk about my turban. Yeah. Yeah. They said, you take your turban off, right? Otherwise, you cannot get a job. Brother, can we get so what we want to know, what we want to know, mm. I mean, how can we gel together you know, all the different faiths together. That's why there's a movement of interfaith, multi-faith. Okay. I really make a plea, please, 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 okay. learn about other faiths as well. Okay. <laughs> if you would not learn about other faiths, what will happen is we would be repeating, you know, what is happening uh, already. Thank okay. you. Uh, my, my question. Can you be allowed and a little, sorry, just for the pe people to hear. <laughs> Uh, my question is uh, to Brother Abdullah. Uh, I respect your critique of uh, liberalism and communism, but I, I, I think you may have a very rose-tinted view of Islamic scholarship. Uh, it has been pointed out to you that there are differences in Islamic scholarship, but you sort of just pass them over and just say, well, whatever the case, Sharia cannot change. But Here's the question though, what is Sharia actually? Uh, in terms of the first source of Sharia law, the Quran, 
there are a number of sciences to filter from the Quran laws. None of these sciences are agreed on by Muslim scholars. Ask a Muslim scholar how many verses are abrogated, and you will have answers of five verses and 255 verses. So or no abrogation is, at all. Or no abrogation at all. But with Sunnis, is generally uh, there are there is abrogation. Okay. And uh, sorry, I just, just to actually uh, put my point across. Mm. So, in your reading of the Quran, you claim that you quoted chapter two, verse one nine three to fight them until there is no more fitna and all deen is for Allah but you fail to quote the context or indeed any reference for your argument the context was from verse 2190 which says fi alladheena fight those in the way of Allah those who fight you so this does not refer to enforcing the law on people it is a wartime situation you did the same with chapter 4 verse 88 it was clearly about al-munafiqoon the hypocrites it is not for anyone who commits treason. So, I'm just trying to prove a point. I mean, you have a, a fair right to read the Quran just like any one of us. But it seems to me that you are putting forward that Islam is a monolithic entity with very little problem in legal application. That's not the case. I, I think uh, Mr. Mustafa Akhil, Dr. Just the Mustafa, Mustafa, brother Mustafa. Just brother Mustafa. Not a big, yeah. I think he has a far more realistic outlook when he talks about the consensus. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. My question also goes to Brother Abdullah, and I was just wondering. Speak up, please, brother. I was just wondering uh, how does your model deals with the idea of pluralism? Because we are living in the age of mm. global world, and we have many people coming from different backgrounds. Mm. In the same city, we have Christians, Muslims, Pious <coughs> pious people, less pious people, you know, um, uh, you might born in a Muslim society, you might call yourself Muslim, but you may not be practicing your religion. How does your model deal with all these different okay. ideas in yeah. society? All right, well, uh, okay. so thanks, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, who, who was your question to, both? Oh, no, no, there's a free, free question. Three questions, one, two, three, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. There was no question for me, so... <laughs> no, 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 the first, the first, no, 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 no. The, the first question in terms of, um, in terms of dialogue, in terms of interfaith dialogue, how do we go forward and stuff like that? Yeah. Well, how do we go in terms of interfaith dialogue? Um, well, it's a huge question. <laughs> like, first of all, I should reiterate that I don't see Islam as a political system I says I, I believe Islam has political values which we will uphold forever inshallah but uh, it, it's not a system that will replace other systems and you can give Islamic colors to all different to see, see the state to empires to modern democracies and so on well how will we talk with the uh, and by the way one more thing the Ottoman Caliphate actually began embracing liberal democracy in the late Ottoman Empire, and that's the story. So the, cal the Caliph had opened a parliament. It was becoming like England, you know, actually, basically, before it was destroyed by uh, a Turkish general, you know, in 1924. Um, so, a very sacred one. How do we have interfaith with... Well, <laughs> interfaith... Since 9-11, interfaith has become something like fashionable. You do interfaith and you smile to the cameras and everybody loves each other. We should do this, I think, in a more honest and bold fashion. Yep. I mean, I've been to a one meeting, which was a good one, it said the tough questions, Islam and the West. We generally accuse the Westerners, and we're right, for imperialism. Like, they've, they've, they have a history of colonialism, crusades, like modern day attacks or like they had their double standards in international law, Israel's you know, supports from US and the West in general. So we are generally critical of their policies towards our, us and we are generally very right. When it comes to them, they are generally critical of the lack of freedom in our part of the world, that missionaries are, missionaries are being killed, converts are executed, and they have some, you know, valid, I think, reasons to criticize those. So I think we should be both honest about these problems. Secondly, I think Islam, Christianity, and Judaism share a lot of common values. These are monotheistic faiths, especially in the face of the Richard Dawkinses of the world, 
you know, we share a lot of moral values. And I think for a long time, we've seen Christians as the others. But in the modern world, I should tell you, I mean, Christians and Muslims and believing Jews are actually very much similar on their moral values. I mean, the criticism you bring to the lack of morality in the West, which I agree to a great extent, but which I don't, for which I don't call authoritarian states to intervene, is also a criticism you can see here from some Christians, and I think we share a commonality there. So the moral aspect is, very, is something that we agree on. And we can build, you know, bridges there. Uh, and also I think to, to, we should stop seeing the most aggressive elements of the other civilization as its representative. I mean, in Turkey, the most famous pastor in Turkey was the guy who wanted to burn the Koran in Florida. Well, there are other pastors which are, which are nice and respectable people. So, and I think we have, they do the same thing when it comes to us. Okay. So, just okay. a few things. All right, just give me a little bit more time to answer those, those two questions. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll just, 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 just when you're finished answering one. Oh, okay, well, I, I think they don't they ask me for the last two, so I'll just, I'll just continue them with those two then. Um, all right, well, Oh, they should have been invited to other, other faiths. Um, we sent out mass mail shots to everyone. Someone sent them back. I'm not Muslim, so why should I be coming? But, um, uh, but it's good to see that you came to our last event in a mosque between a Christian and a Muslim, and we were um, sharing our, our beliefs. And what, I, what I was saying was but, that I am making okay. conscious effort. Yeah. Right? I'm not in interfaith as it looks fashionable, right? because I'm fighting my battles even there. Mm. Yeah, there are a lot of problems. There are a lot of problems. That's the point which I'm making. Sure, sure. All right. Um, so, uh, as I said, um, my organisation, like Muslim Debate Initiative, we have we're all about uh, interfaith and interpolitical, into, into everything. <laughs> so, uh, so no, I, I totally agree with you, and we are actively encouraging it. And as I said, you, you're one of you probably want on our mailing list because you, you come to a lot of our events, and, and please come, continue to come to come to us. Um, as for the issue of uh, that gentleman there regarding differences in Islamic scholarship. Um, I, said, look, I think I'm going to be a broken record player and, and basically say the same thing I've said again, which is, yes, but that's, that's normal, that's human. Everyone, every single scholarship of, of any single subject you can humanly imagine on the face of this planet, from science to uh, political philosophy amongst liberals, amongst communists, amongst uh, whatever, uh, everyone disagrees. In fact, uh, as the philosopher John Keats once said, uh, uh, liberals only agree on the name. <laughs> yeah. See, there's, 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 there's a difference, though. You okay. see Sharia's from God. They okay. don't see no, no. anything's from God. Let me no, let me finish. Um, I didn't say uh, where Sharia came from. I just said that we need to establish Sharia. Sharia, in essence, emanates from uh, 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 the human perception of texts, which these texts are to do with actions, mandating actions. So, uh, in the Quran, there is the muhkam, the clear texts. And that establishes a baseline that we all agree on. There's no difference of opinion in Mohkam. Sorry, However, no brother, let, 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 brother, let, let me finish. Brother, finish. finish. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Frank, well, yes, let yes. finish, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. The, 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 the clear baseline text, but there is then the Mutashabi heart, which there is difference of opinion yeah. on, and that's fine. It's not a problem. The Prophet Muhammad Sassam didn't have a problem with Sahabas having this in opinion. That's not an issue. As long as we find a way whereby, uh, and historically we did, where the Caliph can do what's called Tabanni, where the caliph says, I will adopt for the purposes of legal, uh, legal uh, le legislation a opinion, and then when, that, when the caliph is from power, the next caliph will can change that legal opinion. That's fine. Opinions can change all the time. That's a great thing about it. But, just like in liberal theory, whoever's in the government has the authority to establish their adoption or opinion as law. Right? No country, no state can get away from it, and I, 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 you know, I really get... Um, uh, I'm really bewildered when people put this allegation to Islam and I say, look in the mirror. Everyone does this. Why is Islam impractical just because we're just like you? <laughs> For the same thing. Yeah, but you see, you right? Brother, 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 anyway, brother, anyway, brother, anyway brother, no, I didn't say kill please. anyone. All right? This is um, not the okay, okay, look, look. No. Also, do not misrepresent uh, the message I'm, I'm, I'm saying today. When I use the example, uh, from Surah An Anfal regarding the issue of deen. I didn't say, I wasn't using that ayah to prove that we can implement Islam in politics. I, I can use other ayahs, loads of others. I was using the ayah as an example that the word deen itself has different, you know, two different meanings. You focused on the ayat. I was focusing on the example of, for the word. You, you see, so. Brother. No, 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 no. I don't need to give you a context when I'm showing you. you, that, you let, 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 me finish, let me finish. 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 
I don't need to give you a context for something which is not legal, so a non-legal context, to show you that a word used in one, se- uh, one uh, sentence can mean something else in the same sentence. Like the word done in Arabic can mean certainty, and in another sentence it means doubt, or something that's doubtful. See? So this is Arabic language, and I use that, that ayat of the Quran to show you an uh, example of Arabic language. Uh, I'm, like, uh, I'm not too sure uh, why you wanted to pick that out and say, but it was talking about jihad. Okay, fine. It was oh, talking. Sorry, about, fine, 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 fine. It was talking about jihad. But my point still proven. The word deen refers to judgment uh, well, in that sense, or or come under come under power. Or uh, I gave you a list of I gave you a list of definitions. Brother, do you want to answer the other yeah. question? It's okay, becoming yeah, a debate sure, between sure. you. All right, sure, you know, sure. Just answer no, that's that. fine. That's fine. If you if I mean, you got more to speak to him after, inshallah. This is as I said. I just wanted you to to understand. You know what I was saying that with that regard first. As for the issue about plurality, again, this is the same question we keep thinking and we we are told to think this yeah it's not it's not that you know we don't have a problem if i if you meet a hanafi or a shafi we don't have a problem but we are told to think that our deen is not implementable because people have difference of opinion we're told to think this the rand corporation who's who's very great at giving advice to the american government regarding how to manipulate muslims um, said that there's opportunities to get american interests by inciting sunni and shia against each other or at least at least between the difference within sunni and shia. That's, that's the term they used yeah so why is it that I have to answer for plurality when, when they themselves uh, when they themselves have to adopt opinions amongst a sea of plurality and uh, and impose one opinion uh, against others? In fact, I would argue that Islam respects plurality more than liberalism because we give uh, Jews and Christians their own law systems, whereas in the, in, in the West they don't. In fact, when you talk about Sharia, they go nuts and they think you're going to take over and stop you know cutting people's heads off. Yeah. So. We don't believe in a one law for all because we don't believe that we should impose our beliefs on you if you are a Jew and a Christian. So we respect plurality better than the West. In fact, maybe the West could learn from us. Mm. Okay. <laughs> We're going to take another round of questions, brother. My apologies if you want to speak to him after. Please speak to him after. But um, we're going to take a few rounds of questions. There's a brother at the door. We take, um, I'm going to try and equal it out. Try and get a system as well. Yes. One and two. So, so one, two, oh, and so, three. So, guide the door then, step first. Yes. The brother. Sorry? Yeah. Brother. Guide the door. Yeah. Yeah. I tend to agree with you, actually. On you ha- sorry, you have to be a little. I tend while. to agree with you on the phenomena of, I don't know, political union realization in the short term. It's true. In history, there was very little, particularly after Mongol invasion, there was divided states. But this is a known physical phenomenon, and you can't impose, uh, let's be honest, an elite that would come to powers, you know, in, like in communism's belief and power on everybody simultaneously under the banner of Islam. This, I think people understand. But Brother, speak up. Do, you think, people are... do you think it was acceptable for Abraham Lincoln to start a war under the excuse of slavery, to unite a continent that had never been united before, separate states with legal systems, maintaining their separate legal canonical systems, maintaining separate laws in every single state, only on a single issue of which after slavery they did not, they reneged on the agreement of 40 acres and a mule to the black slaves, number one. And for the European Union, which has never been united ever in history, ever, to implement a project of union, which may have obviously the British Isles, which is slightly separate, uh, (coughs) contending it, to the extent of open borders and effectively one parliamentary government with separate states or local state. Why is it acceptable mm. for a certain type of person on this earth to produce, pursue and move millions of people in labor and screw up? They stole money. They caused a recession knowingly and destroyed lives in all the countries. Why is it acceptable okay. for them to pursue the notion of some kind okay. of open border, open trade, mm. or open access economy? Let's be honest, mm. on the basis of Anglo-Saxon Thank you, Christian origin Thank and so. not for a region that has only had many states, yeah. many, okay. in 60 years or 70 years. Thank you, brother. It's unacceptable in the real world. Thank you, brother. The sister over there, yeah. Hi, uh, I've just got this in the thing here. It's a uh, tell mama. It's about Islamophobia and anti-Muslim hate crime. Yeah. And I'm sure many Muslims here have, including myself, have uh, been... Uh, you know, exposed to this kind of Islamophobia, attacks, racist remarks, everything really. And uh, I mean, I think, well, that was your uh, state in mind is utopic because, I mean, 
and the couple circles there are, we have different sex and even the different sex can't uh, communicate mm -hmm. with each other. I mean, we've seen in uh, other uh, countries. Uh, at the moment, my question would be, you know, how would you achieve this in Sharia? How would, are you planning a state in the Middle East where we just alienate ourselves, isolate ourselves off to the Western world? Aren't we, isn't Islam about dialogue and about inter interaction, integration within the society? Do we just clamp ourselves off and then just say, you know, everyone in the house, do whatever you want, but when you're outside, you have to be according to this? Thank you. Speak up, please, sister. Be down here. Yes. Um, how, if it were to come back, uh, you would use the Quranic injunctions to, to apply to a slave law. So therefore... To, you, to protect the slaves. It came back, so therefore, because it's not abolished. That's, uh, that's really worrying, because that means, um, you know, within the Muslim Ummah, we would accept this whole notion of, you know, compromise. You know, because this is what, what's justified in Saudi Arabia when we see um, under Islam that, you know, it is acceptable to have a concubine. So therefore, you know, sexual slavery would be acceptable, you know. So how would you, how would you deal with that in, in your, uh, or your perception of what an Islamic state is? You know, this whole notion of having a concubine, because, you know, it would be acceptable if slavery came back because, it would, you know, it was, you know, permissible. Okay. So yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. So there are two questions to me. Well, actually one question for me. This, you ask, so the question was, maybe you didn't hear, why U.S. was united by Abraham Lincoln, you know, opening a war and bringing all the states. Well, it was united before, but he, you know, he re reaffirmed the union and, you know. Then, and why there's an EU and why cannot there be an Islamic union? Well, I'm not against a Middle Eastern union. I mean, uh, well, why Islamic? Why Muslims have to be in the same political... I mean, will we trade with each other, but we will not trade with others? Why? Is it good for us to be that way? I mean, Ottomans always traded with Europe. I mean, so, is, why, why should we be close? Should we only read our books and not read, not read Western books and Chinese books? Should we only eat our dates and not buy dates from somebody else? Why is the logic behind that? I don't see. I mean... I don't think Islam tells us that we should live in closed circles in which only Muslims live. Uh, why not? Actually, I'm so glad that there are more Muslims in the European Union. For example, I'm so glad that I hope that Bosnia Herzegovina will be a part of Europe at some point, probably before Turkey, because the French will never take us. <laughs> but, so that there will be a Muslim voice in Europe. I would not have once wanted to see them get away from the just have a closed box of Muslims. So the thing is, I believe that we can have EU-like structures, and Turkey was actually planning to initiate that before the Arab Spring, before the Syrian tyranny started to kill their own people and had their. Uh, we, we, we have a problem with Syria now, but so Turkey was trying to, for example, open up this open borders union with Syria, Jordan, and so on. That these are great, so we should have those more dialogue. But I don't think why we should get away from the West and only trade with each other. I don't. I, I don't think that is what Islam demands from us, but that's not what you want. No, what I said was, why is it considered, I didn't say not to trade with the West, but the EU definitely don't have tariffs between each other mm. and impose protectionist tariffs and the US on everyone else. So my question wasn't about mm. the West. Okay. Okay. My question, why is it less likely and considered immoral or wrong or crazy or no, no. when the Europe has just saying. now destroyed seven, eight economies by stealing as a fact. I know. That's Europe, why I'm not a fan of European But no Union. one complained about the notion, not that, not whether they wanted it or not. But the notion of, the Christian of European club, Union. Which is what it is in cultural origin. A yeah. white Christian club uniting, understandably, with trade. Why is it? Let me one, tell you. One reason. Okay, brother, okay, brother, 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 please, please, brother, brother, okay, please, brother, please, please. Let the brother answer Europe, the question. Sorry, Europe no is no not a Christian club because... In cultural origin. Because Brazil is not a part of that. Or, you know, there are other Christian parts of the world. There are African Christians. So it is not a Christian club in the sense that all the world, all the Christians of the world are coming and uniting. Europe is an entity which is shaped by Christianity, yes. It's also a very secularist tradition. So it's just a product of all this. And there are people who want to keep it as a Christian. It's actually a post-Christian club. They're not even Christians anymore, most of them. And I think the wise attitude towards the EU is the British way. Try to keep it as a, like a trade-based union in which others can join. 
But, but I'm against like you trade. being a Christian club in that no, sense. And as for trade, no problem. Yeah, let's have trade unions all across the world, in the Middle East as well. But I don't think that Islam mandates that we would have a political entity of Muslims okay. that are ruled by a central... Thank you, brother. Yeah. One more thing. Oh, the other question. Okay, so one thing. Sla Please. You're you're very right on slavery. Let me just add one thing. When the Ottoman em Empire banned slave trade in 1856, there was a revolt against the Ottoman Empire in the Saudi... But then, not Saudi then, but in the Arabian Peninsula by the Wahhabi leader, Red Sheriff Abdul Muttalib, and he said you are violating the Sharia by, because Sharia has slavery as a part of it. And the Ottoman je, je, scholar Jadid Pasha, and I tell that episode in my book, he explained, he tried to explain that slavery is not an integral part of Islam. It just happened to be at the time and Sharia, you know, regulated that, but it's not a value. Sexual so, slavery is Yeah, all sorts of slavery. I mean, I'm against all sorts of slavery. So... And the fact that it is mentioned in Islamic sources, for me, tells actually that we should see the historicity of those Islamic sources. I mean, it's, including the Quran, th uh, some institutions were addressed in Islamic law, not because they were universally Islamic, it just happened to be at the time. And I think Islamic law addressed that. But I think times change and institutions change. Okay. And I think slavery should not come back at any time. Okay. Okay, anyway. um, okay so on to a few, few points off the bat. And I think it's very good because there are a lot of misconceptions which now Muslims have now embraced. Mm. And they've been told about uh, uh, Islam and the issue of caliphate. And, and inshallah, I'm going to try to you know, myth bust them. Um, the belief that caliphate is a utopia, no one's ever said that. Right? The utopia is impossible because human beings have free will and, and hence there's always going to be a few people that want to go their own way, so to speak, so, uh, and commit crimes. So uh, utopia is impossible. So no one said it and no one expects it. Um, something very interesting. You know Somalia, very interesting country. About 30 years ago, everyone was fighting, virtually everyone else, and all these different tribal fights, it, was, it, was, it just kept it killing, 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 chaos. Uh, there was, there was, you know, it was just much like the Jahili of the Arabs, uh, you know, pre-Islamic. And if if someone said that you could unite them on Islam, you say ain't gonna happen. That's never twenty years ago, never, never gonna happen. And suddenly you had the Islamic courts militia rose up, and they were they started to unite the tribe. People were saying no more tribes, only Islam. They were in in public demonstrations in in Mogadishu, and America saw that as a threat. And they saw it as a threat because if the Somalis can unite on Islam, no offense, Somalis, but then anyone can unite. What about the urbanized Muslims? What about anyone else? We can all unite on Islam. So as merely as it was created, they, they, they helped Ethiopia to invade and uh, American uh, uh, warplanes bombed it. And now it's again returned back to its democ a democratic situation of everyone fighting everybody else with a democracy in place as democracies are wanting to do. Yeah, and again, like Iraq as well. So what we see is that you can unite different people as long as you don't make your uh, you, you you cast off the shackles of Jahiliya, thinking my tribe, my country, or whatever, and you embrace. We're all Muslim. Mm. What's the issue? I don't care if a Shafi is, is ruling over me or a or a, a Maliki. Well, I'm Maliki myself, but okay, obviously I wouldn't care. But I don't care which school of thought rules over me as long as I know that. They are, they are making the sources of Islam the, 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 the point of reference. And even if they take a hadith, which I don't view as sahih, I know that they're not, they're not trying to rule over me with, with kufr or non-Islam. They're doing the best they can, and they truly believe it, and that makes it Islamic. Yeah? Okay. If they make a mistake, they get one reward. That's what the Prophet said. Now, if I can accept this, and I'm not a special human being, then anyone else, surely anyone else can accept this. And Muslims are accepting this, and the Quran... Uh, 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 moves us to accept this. Omat al wahida be not divided amongst yourselves. Don't found, don't split into sects. Mm. Don't say, oh, I'm I'm one sect. I'm better than you. Don't fight. But in this time and age, if you say, you know what? If you th look at today's world and you judge what is possible, or impossible by what is today, you will never move ahead. You become the mutahalif. You become the backward person. Yeah. I'm saying, let's look at, ahead at the possibility of the future. And it's a very uh, a credible possibility. So I think uh, we should cast off this, uh, uh, this silly shackles, uh, post-colonial shackles that we can never unite and embrace the possibility in the future, uh, a very soon future, judging by what the polls have shown, 
that we can unite our countries if we just had the will. And, and lastly, there's a... Uh, I'm just trying to... Okay. Is that for the same question, brother? Uh, uh, yes, that's, 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 can that's, we just that's do the question. Briefly, yeah, sure, you've got another sure, sure. quite a big question. And as I said, right. um, you mentioned something, my perception of Islamic State. I've said nothing which is actually from any school of thought in any of my lecture. This is actually agreed upon by all schools of thought. I have never, I have not said one, I haven't said the caliph must be a mushtid or a caliph must be from the Quraysh. These are different differences of opinion, right? I haven't said that. I just said that we elect a leader. We all agree on that. We all agree on the caliph, uh, on the caliph faith. 1,400 years, Imam Shatibi Ali ibn Khadun, who he quotes in his own book, says it's actually obligatory. So uh, it's not my perception. I've actually been uh, a madhab neutral in my presentation, or school of thought neutral if you're not Arabic speaker. Right, um, and lastly, to answer the question of that sister who asked about um, uh, concubinage. Um, the issue about concubinage, sister, is you might, I mean, obviously you're like, okay, it was a practice at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, and the Quran didn't abolish it, but it regulated it and made sure that people were given their rights. There was option for, for the slaves to be free, to work themselves out of freedom. And, uh, and if basically, if, uh, uh, from, from my knowledge, if a, child, if a slave, a woman becomes pregnant, then she, gets, she, she becomes um, free. So it, it, Islam tried to find any excuse and any reason to let slaves go free without disrupting the economic system and causing fighting and problems like the, the American Civil War did when they just did an instant abolishment. And remember, the West only abolished it coincidentally when the Industrial Revolution was coming and they could actually automate a lot of these, the, the, these tasks. Coincidence. So, um, but I'll say this. If you, uh, there's two points, my two, my two points in this. One, if slavery's gone, so it's a moot discussion. Yeah, there's wage slavery and debt slavery created by a uh, liberal economic system, uh, but that's not slavery in the legal sense. So it's finished. We don't need to talk about it anymore. You know, we can move on. But and that's why I said, if, if the I, what I the reason why I said, and very importantly, that we don't that nothing in the Quran has changed is because as I said, if the situation was to come, uh, you know, if we went back in time or whatever in the time machine, we'd still have to apply um, the laws if the, if there was the if the reality existed. But the Quran hasn't been abrogated by reality. That, that's my point. And if you entertain that, then everything can be abrogated in the Quran by reality. What's to stop it? Maybe God made a mistake. Maybe God didn't see the future. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, it's like, you know, does God ever know anything or everything? Thank you, brother. Obviously. So my point is that um, nothing's abrogated uh, in the Quran by reality. But if the reality does not exist, then there's no need to, uh, to discuss it anymore, and going, going back on it is, uh, is a, a... Thank you, brother. Point. Thanks a lot. I'm going to take one more round of questions. Well, a very brief question. With your, speak up, brother? Uh, with your concept of freedom to sin, are you, one, are you disregarding a social effect? Secondly, are you suggesting a separation of re religion and state? Okay. Uh, this is the... One, one um, I actually have a comment because it's related to the question. Is it a question, brother? Pardon? Is it a question? <laughs> there, there is a question. But it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, I but you need can. a prelude. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You need to contextualize your question, don't you? Briefly, please. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, um, as as brother Wright rightly pointed out on apostasy, there are several hadiths where where Prophet 
Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't actually, uh, you know, order the killing of the apostate. And, 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 the re uh, and the reason why apostasy was brought into Islam was because, because people were going into Islam and they're coming out next day and they were telling everybody lies that they went it, they didn't find anything good, so they went back to their old religion. And that was just to defame Islam. It was that kind of apostasy that, was, uh, that carried that punishment. People became apostate after that and it was not a problem. Now, when a person becomes a Muslim, or as, as you Brother, say, you are a Muslim. Yeah, this is a question. This is a question. Oh, it is a question. Though. Yeah, it's a question. <laughs> as you say, you are the Muslim. You are a Muslim. Then you have to be in the law of Muslims, and the law states that you have to offer prayers five times every day. Mm. I have to file my taxes every year, and I hate filing taxes, <laughs> and I hate paying taxes. But I have to do that because I'm living in this country. I'm a citizen of this country. I'm not a citizen of this country, but I'm living here. Not too much detail. Brother, immigration might be in the room. Just <laughs> <laughs> so, so my question, my, my, my question to you is that if I have to obey the laws of this country, and, and taxation is a law, and prayer is a law, mm. then why is it why is it you, why do you think it's fair for me to pay taxes but it's unfair to make somebody pray so if they are making me pay taxes why yeah. is it not fair to pray to make somebody pray great, great question, question. Sure. i'm sure you agree sure. also yeah. well let me begin with what with one thing i mean of what you said there will be a caliph and he will make decisions Brother, are you going to answer his question okay sure, his sure sure i'll just want but i want it it's a line of thinking so just, okay. just one thing but, yeah. there will be a caliph he will make decisions and if he makes a wrong decision, he will get one, you know, reward. I mean, what if the caliph makes a decision that says, it's fit not to criticize me, and he puts me in jail for that and cuts my head, and, you know, he thinks he gets his reward, but I lose my life and so on. The thing is, I don't really care whether my ruler is Hanafi, Shafi, or... I don't even care if he's Muslim or not. I care whether he protects my five fundamental values of the Sharia. My right to life, religion, property, lineage, my right to criticize, my right to think. And he can be a just Christian, he can be a just fair atheist, he can be a Muslim tyrant. There are so-called Muslim tyrants, there are caliphs who were tyrants and who beheaded people for standing against them for things. So why we think that some caliph would be an honest, like a noble person, I, unless we have and w once we give him that like mandate, the so-called divine mandate, why would we think that he will be fair to us? I mean, I think that's a big danger. Well, coming to your question. Thank you. Very good point. Why, why do we pay taxes? Well, we pay taxes because there is... No, no, I, my question is, okay, they, no, no. they are making me pay taxes. Okay. Coercion, basically. Coercion. Yes. That is, actually, that is the precise point that I'm talking about. When you start to define as Islam as a political system, with laws, and if you think praying is a law, like uh, fasting is a law, and every injunction of religion is a law, it will be mandated. The problem is that when you pay taxes without disliking the British government, whatever, state, crown, there's, there's no problem, right? You're not a monophic, right? No problem. I mean, it's, it doesn't count. You won't be asked in afterlife about this. You just, the state doesn't want your heart. The state just wants your money. Good. Islam Good. wants your heart. Mm. If you pray because an Islamic state forces you, it is fine for everybody except your ahirat. I mean, it, you should be doing out of your own mm. genuine conviction. That's the big difference between something that is imposed and that is something done voluntarily. And in my book, I try to look at Islamic law and understand what, is, what should be voluntary and what should be enforced. Of course, theft will be punished. Of course, and it's important that the Quran has four hududs all about social crimes, but not personal <coughs> sins. Well, crimes on, like punishments on personal sins came later as the ulama expanded all these Hudud laws. That's a part of my book. Well, not so, paying his taxes is theft. Yeah. Sorry? Not paying his taxes is theft. Yeah, I mean, but if not, you don't pay taxes. But yeah. not just from the state, from those of us that are dependent on those taxes. Exactly, you're right. So, there is also a social context to it. So, when you don't pay taxes, you're using the highways or whatever. I, I, I think, I think I, in Islam, uh, prayer, zakat, fasting are compulsory. They are fariz, they are obligatory, like kind of there's, there's Not no politically obligatory, they're obligatory to be a good Muslim. 
But then you are you are you are not living to the contract. You became a Muslim. You had a pact with Allah. And who punishes you for that? Mm. Allah punishes, but but the state as well. Pardon? The state, state as well. Because does the state because, represent Allah? Who's no, the state? No, because there's a hadith. Because there's a hadith where Prophet Muhammad said that everybody is in charge of the subjects under him. And he goes on that man is in charge for the wife and the kids and the, and the, and the, uh, and the, uh, and the tribal leader is responsible for the tribe. Henceforth, you know. But which hadith is this? Yeah. Pardon? You know, it, didn't, it didn't say tribe, it said the Imam is responsible for his subjects. Yes, and, and going on Muslims. to Imam is responsible for his yeah. subjects. So it is responsibility of Imam to make his subjects pray. And I have known a lot of people who were from India and they were not Namazi. They yeah. didn't used to pray Namaz at all. And they went to Saudi Arabia, lived there for 10 years, and now they don't miss a prayer. And they were forced to pray in, there, in Saudi Arabia. Well, I also met people who hated Islam because they were forced by oppressive Imams to pray or, you know, have genital mutilation or whatever, what that imam thinks is yeah. Islamic. So, I generally do not think that there should be entities on earth which forces us to be good Muslims. We will, of course, pay taxes. We will, of course, be punished if we are thieves or mm. killers and so on. Mm. That's a different level, whereas I think our personal piety is a different level. But and the best thing a state should yeah. give me on that is After freedom. You too, too. I don't need a state to, to punish me to go to mosque to be pious. Okay, right. I will be more pious if I do by myself. Thank you, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Oh. Okay, that's probably. Uh, there is another question. Oh, sorry. Uh, it was social you, effects. You, you, you mentioned about the freedom to sin. Yeah. Are you disregarding the social effect and context one? And secondly, are you suggesting a separation of state and religion? Yeah. Yes. Let me begin with the second one. Yes, I am arguing for separation of state and religion, although I am not arguing for separation of religion and politics. I think Islam guides the political sphere, but we Muslims have different ideas about it. You can be an Islamic liberal, as I probably am. You can be an Islamic socialist. You can be an Islamic nationalist. We have those in Turkey. Uh, you can be all sorts of things, and you can have political parties, I think, from these inspirations. Mm -hmm. But I think the state should be neutral and should not be mandating religion. Because we're speaking of a modern state which has a standardized law. Mm -hmm. In pre-modern times, yes, there were different laws, the Christian Sharia and Islam, because state does not have these centralized laws. We're living under centralized mm -hmm. states mm -hmm. as necessity mm -hmm. because of all this technology. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I believe in... My, my argument is for As for freedom to sin, I know it's a controversial topic, and I, this is not to condone sin, mm -hmm. but when, of course there will be public decency, mm -hmm. but the level of that has to be democratically decided, I would say, and it, it's, a, it's a matter of balance. But I think if you say people to people, you can commit sin, whatever it is, like drink alcohol, yeah. only in their homes, well, yes, you will have a lot of people, you know, drinking in their homes, and you will have a lot of mafia, you know, trading that, which was seen in this great experiments with the United States in the 30s, they tried all, it didn't make the society more pious, it made society more hypocritical and led to the creation of mafia and so on. So there will be laws of public decency, and this will change from society to society. Uh, but I don't think this should come to the point of having a totalitarian state controlling our every behavior, so it's, it's a matter of balance. Yeah. And one final thing. There was a question about, sorry, Egypt? Yeah. I think that's the right question. It was about to you? Yeah. Okay, no. sorry about that. Yeah. Um, okay, that's all I should say. Okay. okay. All right. Um, a few points. I think it's illustrated more very, very wonderfully by the Prophet Muhammad Sassam, who said, he enumerated a number of sins, and he said, whoever commits any of these sins will be punished in this world, and there will be an expiation for him. Whoever commits any of these sins, but Allah conceals it, so in private, basically, uh, then it will be for Allah to decide. If he wills, he will forgive him, and if he wills, he will punish him. Um, as we know, zina, or, uh, or il illicit you know, sexual uh, intercourse, is a, it doesn't cause physical harm necess necessarily, but there is perhaps an emotional harm, and it's obviously a bigger problem socially. But in essence, it's, you know, the liberal criteria is that you know, physical harm, there is no physical harm being done. Yet it's that the Quran itself bans it outright, which is illiberal by liberal standards. So let's not uh, kill ourselves that the Quran is, is being Ill illiberal, which is, is not a bad thing. Um, when it comes to the issue of, um, yeah, as I said, coercion, it's, it's, it's a good point. Um, you'll get coerced in everything. 
uh, even uh, you know, paying your taxes and all, all, those, all those such things uh, which you get coerced. And for example, you get coerced uh, on the level of alcohol you can drink to, you know, before you, you drive your car. You might be a good driver, maybe even when you're drunk. But because of a social problem with alcohol, they have to limit everyone's <laughs> intake of that, for example. So, and again, what about, what about the freedom to express yourself in the West? Can you say an insulting you know, comment about race? No, you can't. But why not? I'm not physically harming anyone by saying that. Why do they, do they stop that? Because they, their own theorists realized that what people say in public creates mass prejudice and causes problems and attacks and leads to, leads to violence, not, not directly, but indirectly. And so they started to ban all these racial slurs, and they banned um, uh, like said, so many things. You know, sexual harassment is banned as well, even if you don't touch uh, the person opposite gender, that's still banned. Why is that? Liberals have realized that the theory of, liberal doesn't, theory of liberalism doesn't actually work uh, when you apply it to human beings. They, they, they've been pragmatic and said, okay, you can't say sexual harassment, uh, words of sexual harassment. So they, these are aspects which you are coerced in this society to uh, abide by a morality of some kind. Uh, so, and and it, still, it still exists. But um, the point was mentioned, in a, if Islam is the state and the state is Islam, which I, I'm not saying at all, the, the state is just an institution which implements the political aspects of Islam, not, it isn't, it's not, it, it's not is Islam, uh, then it, it, you know, it wants your heart, whereas a, a secular state doesn't want your heart. Oh, okay, so Muslims aren't told to be uh, a, a pledge of allegiance to England or America, and that we should embrace British values. And We're not told that, right? They don't want our heart in that, right? Wrong. They do. Nationalism is the modern religion. It's a secularist religion. And the, uh, you know, um, giving obedience to the state is the new form of worship. Mm -hmm. And as Muslims, uh, the Prophet Muhammad told us, that anyone who calls for Asabiyah, which is you know, tribalism or nationalism, mm -hmm. who fights for Asabiyah, who dies for Asabiyah, is not one of us. So you can't say you can be a Muslim or be a nationalist anymore. You can be a Muslim and a racist. But as for um, human rights declaration and NATO and um, should we used to be separate from Christians, okay, NATO and, and human rights declaration aside, um, we're not separate from Christians. The, the, the historical caliphate was living together with Christians and Jews. And, I mean, in fact, we gave Christians and Jews their own autonomous areas. And, and in the Ottoman times, it was called Milet, I think it was called, is that the, yeah. the term? Yeah. Um, so we, we give to Christians and Jews something even better. Not only will we interact and mix with them, but they can have their own areas. Uh, we won't complain about them being ghettoized and not integrating and they must assimilate. We won't say that to them. We say, fine, have your area. Have your own culture and whatever you want to practice in that area. And in business, you, yeah, you, they, we, we mix in the marketplaces, we mix in the in the community halls. Some places you mix in the mosques and the, and the churches in the Andalus, for example. These issues are not a problem. I'm not arguing for any separation at all. That's one of the misrepresentations of the issue of caliphate that is pervading the Muslim mind, which stops us uh, from going back to it. As for human rights and NATO, um, yes, NATO. What would we do with NATO? Well, what, better question is, what does NATO do to us? in the modern day. What does NATO do to us? When you ask that question, then you know my response. As for, as for Egypt, um, you know, if you ask an Egyptian, you know, basically like, uh, you know, uh, yeah, all for Islam, should we unite with whomever, and they say no. Well, look, I think if you go to every Muslim and you ask, do you want unity in the Muslim world? Is it a bad thing if the Muslim world, you know, of all the Muslims, you know, or we're together, they'd say, no, it's not a bad thing, we want that. In fact, I don't think any Muslim said, no, I don't want to join any other Muslim, I want to be myself. I, I haven't actually encountered a Muslim that said that. But I think because of the tribal jahiliya, so to speak, that still pervades the Muslim world, if you mention, let's say, Egypt and Algeria, for example, oh, oh not Algerians, oh no, we had a football <laughs> confrontation with them, and, and like, hell no. But everyone else, that's fine, yeah, um, um, to Wahida. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so, um, so that, that's fine. Now, I, I'm not a, this is going to be the final misrepresentation I, I deal with today. Um, well, well, maybe not the final, but the, the, the conclusion to the, the question is about is this a Sharia or is it the Khilafah a totalitarian regime? Let me give an, I'll give an example from, from the Prophet Muhammad's life when he was a, when he was a ruler and he encountered um, there was a woman on the middle of the road and basically in order not to have any problems between the, the genders, uh, women were to take a less conspicuous, um, you, know, you know, I guess you could say, uh, public profile and not be right in the middle of the road with all the guys and, and, and where the guys are, are coming in and, and, and you know uh, attracting them and, and, and vice versa. So he said like, well, okay, women can go on the side of the road and the guys will go in the middle and they shouldn't, they shouldn't basically interact unless there's some business to be conducted. But there was a woman he encountered who was in the middle of the road 
was in right in front of him as well. He was walking with two sahabas uh, with his companion and a woman in the middle of the road that refused to get out of the way, and she appeared to be Muslim. And so the sahaba said, "Oh, should we, you know, should we basically, you know, tell her to go or, or, or remove her?" And the prophet said, "No, she's just rebellious." Right. So there's not like backbiting is haram, but the, there is no Islamic law for 1,000 upon years which has basically prohibited backbiting. The state won't say, I, have, did you backbite this person? Sure, there's, there's public slander, I suppose, but not backbite. There are so many of, the, of these laws that the state does not enforce. And we don't, we don't, we're not conscious of this. We think it must be this totalitarian regime. And why is that? Because when you ever Europe, when they first applied their ideologies in Europe, like in the French Revolution and, of course, Soviet Russia, they applied it to its, the nth degree. That everyone in every aspect in every field must conform to these ideas by force coercion. France was a, a early liberal and secular state, and, and they were totalitarian. For example, you know, Turkey was totalitarian, as your as your experience goes. And we are so used to totalitarian regimes that when someone gives you Islam, they say, "Oh, that can be totalitarian too, right?" See, it is such a horrible situation that we don't know anything but totalitarianism. Islam, you know, is the 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 other way from totalitarianism. You can't drink in public, and there's a good reason why. If you commit a crime when you're drunk, yeah, if you commit a crime, are you, more, are you legally culpable? Your mind is gone, so how can you be morally culpable for doing something that you wouldn't do when, you have, when, you, when you're, you're having the possession of your mind? Mm. But in the West, they will punish you for that. They will punish you for committing a crime that you might not even remember. Islam, let's nip it in the bud. No alcohol and drink in the street, stay at home. Yeah. Mafia was that we banned it for 1,400 years. Alcohol was there any mafia in the Muslim world? No. If you ban it in a country that already has an industrialization where they're producing, they have factories that produce the alcohol, and then you say you ban it, they just they're going to still produce it in secret, of course. You know, it's, it's not going to work. And of course, they have an entitlement mentality, which is liberalism. Thank and you. I think absolutely, finally, mm. final point. There is a hadith about if you see the oppressive ruler that takes away the rights of Islam from the, from the people, you have to rise up against him, or Allah will punish you. This is in the hadith. You must account the ruler even with physical force. All these rebellions that we had at the, during the early times of the caliphates are a good thing. It showed that we were accounting our ruler, not we have to stick under under ruler. And absolutely, finally, sorry about this, really sorry. Imam Shatabi, yeah, who is, is quoted in the Mustafa Akil's book, um, at the Muqasr al-Sharia, protection of the intellect. What was that for? Alcohol. That's why it prohibits alcohol to protect your, your intellect. And as Imam Shatabi said, I'll, and I'll finish with this. Violating the Sharia under the pretext of following the basic objectives or values of Sharia, Maqasid mm-hmm. al-Sharia, it's like the one who cares about the spirit uh, uh, um, without the body. And since the body without the spirit is useless, <coughs> therefore the spirit without the body is useless too. So let's not neglect the Islamic text that gave us these objectives in the first place. And let's not use objectives as an excuse to negate and abrogate text. Like we're, we're, we're God and we know what is abrogated and what is no longer current. Okay, thank you, brother. Thank you. But I just like to, before everyone heads off, I just like to thank all this, thank both of our speakers for coming.